Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first ever Archon Team League Championships. My name is Amaz, apparently, and I'm joined right now by Ryan. How's it going, Crip? Hey, Amaz, how's it going? I like your hair. <laughs> Thanks, man. Is it a big surprise? It's it's not too different, right? I think uh, it looks kind of the same. Now, if shade. if if you were going to if you're going to change it up, that's exactly how I expect you to do it. So good job. Yeah. Well, I, I saw that you were wearing your uh, maroon purple shirt, and I wanted to match it so we can be kind color coded of. today. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> It's actually it's exactly the day. same. It's just a lighting issue. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for mm. sure. Well, it's gonna be a really fun day, guys. Uh, we have different. Uh, we have different formats. We have different casters with different color of hair. And today, we promise to start off with one of the most exciting things that we have in recent Hearthstone memory. We have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar team league going on here with the best players in the world. And it's gonna be a really fun time. It's gonna be a long time. It's gonna be a long league. We have eight weeks to play. And today, we're gonna kick it off with Archon versus Nylum. So, Crip, let's break down how this league is actually gonna happen here. All right, so basically uh, it's a lot of money, and uh, they're going to have to play a lot of games, and it, it is a team battle. So um, it, it's best of 11, and there's three players on each team, and each player on the team brings two decks for a total of six decks per team. All decks must be unique class across all teammates. So, you know, if, if uh, teammate one brings warrior, then you're out of luck. You can't bring your warrior. That's, that's kind of the idea. Uh, each match is a blind pick. Uh, lock decks cannot be picked again in that series, and when a deck wins, it's locked, and the win is awarded. And uh, obviously the first team, the six, uh, takes it. Best of 11, that's what it is. So uh, pretty interesting stuff. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of mm -hmm. dynamic, there's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff that uh, a lot of people who are watching probably won't realize that has to do with, uh, you know, like someone's going to have to play like Priest, you know? So it's, yeah, not about, it's not about winning a game with Patron Warrior, it's about winning a game with like, some slightly new version of Priest because, you know, that's not really getting played. So that's really going to be an interesting part because it is a team effort and uh, the players are going to have to decide amongst each other which one wants to play the um, less standard classes and uh, be responsible for actually winning with them. So it is certainly a team battle and communication experience an ability to play as one is really important. So um, it's nice to have it kicked off with Nylon versus Archon, two very, uh, fairly prolific Hearthstone teams, no? Yeah, I think they've been the best performing Hearthstone teams, you know, objectively speaking, over the past couple of months. Nylon has Life Coach and, and Tice, who's been doing really well. RDU is always a threat to tournaments, and Lothar, even as a team captain. And the caster is also placing top four in events. And of course, Archon, they've, they also dominate tournaments. WCA was all Archon. You know, Firebat's still winning back to back Gfinities. Uh, they are also a high performance team, too. So I think it's really right. appropriate that we start off with them. Um, but also, we want to talk about how the other teams, we have a really good mix of players as well. We have uh, Team Temple Storm and Cloud9, two other top teams. And we also have a mix of some all-stars. We have Team Value Town with guys like Trump there heading the, the captainship. And we also have Team Forsen Boys. Uh, do you have any uh, you know, reading on these teams here, Crip? How do you think they'll prepare, even though that they don't exactly have like the cohesiveness of one team brand? Um, well, they're, they're top teams too. It's fine. It's, it's, <laughs> it's all right. All right. No, but um, in, in all seriousness, um, I think it'll hurt them a little bit because um, when you come to the table as individuals, you kind of have to, you know, be a bit humble in the approach. And I feel that's something that's uh, that's easy to screw up. I'm not I'm not expecting them to screw it up, but they might. They might be like, no, I want to play this. I want to play this. This is what I'm good at. And this like type of mindset might really conflict uh, when it comes to winning as a team. Because, mm -hmm. you know, even even though, you know, let's say uh, Foursome Boys decides to play Grim Patron Warrior and like Tempo Major or whatever, and the other players want right. to play that, you know, he might, he might get two wins, feel good about it, but at the end of the day, he might go home broke. So, you know, that's, that's not the idea. And the ability to work together with people that you're familiar with is certainly an advantage in my mind. And I've played a lot of games where teamwork is very important. And it, Hearthstone is, is one that, you know, it, it's only delved into a little bit. And hopefully this tournament pushes that idea maybe to a higher level. Yeah, that's right. And it's going to take over eight weeks, guys. We're going to be going all the way till September. I think the beginning of September is the last week of play. And we're going to have a lot of chances for the teams to continue to redeem themselves. I believe one team will be eliminated, but ultimately the seven teams that are remaining will be fighting for playoff spots. And we also will have the uh, eventual offline finals. We're, it's going to be a fun time. And we're going to kick it off again with Nylon vs. Archon, which is about to begin. But before we do, we have a couple of segments we want to show you. Player intros. So let's check out the first one here.
I am RDU. I'm playing for Team Nylum. I think I'm known for both tournaments and some favorite decks. People associate me with like Freeze Mage and Rogue. The format of the team link is something really interesting. And because every one of my teammates have a really varied play style, I think we can uh, cover most of the classes correctly and too well. We'll see it will be something really interesting. The strongest deck at the moment is probably gonna be Patron. I am not really sure because the meta changes, like whenever a deck is considered the strongest, then the counters appear, and then the counters are considered to be the strongest, and it's like just a vicious cycle that just repeats itself, so whoever predicts it can find out what's the best deck overall. Hi! I wanna say hi mom to every mother watching the team league. All right, well, already okay. looking a little ghostly there, but uh, I, I'm I'm pretty confident in Team Nylum. If I had to pick one team to represent in terms of pure Hearthstone results and like in terms of their performances, I think they've been the number one team. But it's always pretty close. It's with team pretty Arcos. close, yeah. yeah. It's pretty close with with others too. I, I mean, I, these teams have done well in, on an individual basis um, because that's that's what they're ranked on the past. But uh, we will get to see how work they how well they work together. Um, take this one down uh, and for me you know while we have you know huge names here we just saw RDU you know collect a bunch of giant size checks which you always know is <laughs> success in gaming um, you know it's it's kind of hard uh, to put the, the player versus the player but more of what they're able to win with so if I mean if we see like life coach bring out warrior and then we see um, I don't know maybe against uh, well that's, these are pretty strong classes Wow. Yeah. I was and hoping for something, something a little bit crazier. Right. Really you were hoping maybe Shaman Paladin. or Priest could come out, but yeah. no, not not right now, Crip. Damn. <laughs> There's enough good classes in the game. Damn it. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we're still going to see uh, some pretty interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, there's there's Paladin there. There's some interesting stuff. Yeah, just... and Mage is missing from Nihilum, too. That's what also interests me, because... It feels like they chose Paladin directly over the ro um, over the mage, but more importantly, that both uh, teams seem to value Rogue, which is starting to always loom there as a dark horse. Rogue always gets neglected because of the you know the more obvious classes that people want to complain about, of Hunter, Warlock, etc. Uh, but Rogue is also, I think, very powerful in this format too. So this I doesn't think, surprise uh, me to be there. I think Rogue right now is considered one of the best decks next to Grim Patron Warrior for uh, for ladder. This is the Oil Rogue, of course. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. Kind of working again, uh, and uh, most players agree. So I'm not too surprised to see Rogue because in the Conquest format, um, you know, it is similar to a ladder experience. And uh, I think with this type of class variety, you you kind of see the ladder experience to an even greater extent. Um, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. in some tournaments, when people only bring three classes, it's kind of skewed a little bit. But here with six, looks pretty good to me. I. I think the Paladin is really the adventurous one here. I think the rest is pretty standard. The rest won't have any issues grabbing a win. Yeah, and, I, and I'd, be, I'd be leaning towards Life Coach playing a more control version, and if it's RDU, maybe playing a more aggressive Paladin version we've been seeing. Uh, by the way, guys, we do want to mention the bench rule that if a player loses twice in a row, they're not allowed to play another game until a teammate at least wins one. And so they can't just have one player that they're super reliant upon right. and... Obviously, if they're a little bit cold, they're going to have to sit down on the virtual bench here. Um, but as a result, we do have the players who will be playing different classes. And I, I don't think it's necessarily lined up the way you see it. Like, for example, I don't think Firebat's the one playing Mage and Warlock, guaranteed. It's uh, always an unknown factor up until the, the moment that it's cho cho uh, chosen. Excuse me. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. That's, yeah. That, that kind of changes it up a little bit, uh, at least at the start. Um, yeah, pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. I'm I'm pretty excited to see uh, what what comes out of this. I really am. Um, I think we'll see some standard decks as normal tournaments go, but I'm really hoping we see some adventurous stuff. Even though Conquest is kind of the the format that punishes uh, people from you know playing crazy stuff, I think the limits have to be pushed just a little bit in this case. All right, cool. Well, I'm I'm ready for the first game here, Crip. Um, I mean, is there is there a general class that you feel like people should be sending out first as a feeler? I mean, people always look at classes like Druid, which is even matchups across the field here. But is there another class that you t tend to favor here? 
Um, I think with uh, with conquest format and the fact that you have to decide as a team, I'd be surprised if there's any strategy other than rolling a dice in this case. Mm -hmm. That's fair too. I I do think one, some classes are advantaged over others, though. Warlock is always a pretty strong class to start off too with because it's generally very versatile, and also it throws your opponent off kilter in the very beginning because you don't know exactly mm -hmm. which warlock you're playing. So it it can get a pretty strong win sometimes just solely off that. Uh, the strength and the surprise factor, um, but I agree. You know, there's also nothing wrong with starting off with like Hunter, for example, either. Mm -hmm. That is kind of true. Now that I think about it a little bit more, um, even though we sometimes see players get demoralized when they grab a loss uh, or two uh, in their opening series, um, it feels like the morale as a team can uh, crumble harder than just an individual's. So maybe perhaps opening up with the, the strong classes um, is a pretty good decision, in fact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the first game is about to get underway, guys. Make sure to get out there on social media, hashtag ATLC, and let your friends know about what's going on. Again, this is the biggest event of the year outside of BlizzCon. It's matching that prize pool. It's $250,000. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all the collection of your favorite players and the best teams. I don't really think... Um, people are complaining about this type of lineup. But normally people are like, okay, maybe, you know, we're, we've been seeing some of these familiar faces for a while, but when they're playing for stakes like this in a, in a team format, I think it's really cool because we don't really see teams, you know, battling it out since really the days of fight night, right, Crip? Yeah, and um, it, the team the team format is an interesting one. It's been played out a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to see it again. I'm really glad just to see something else. It feels like every year uh, Blizzard dictates what people will play for tournaments, and uh, anything that goes against that norm is, is really exciting for me. So I'm, I'm really glad this, uh, this event uh, got off the ground, and, uh, well, we're here, and we're about to kick it off. Mm -hmm. Do you have any predictions between Nylum and Archon at all? Nylum and Archon, yeah, it's it's really tough to call. Um, I I kind of have to root for Archon a little bit just because of uh, their dominance on ladder, and uh, as a team, you know, I think they they're probably going into this with maybe the slightest of edges. Oh, already looks like he aged like uh, about fifteen to twenty years in his portrait, but he definitely looks very menacing indeed. Oh, Firebat Firebat in the, meantime. the smooth the smooth skin treatment from the artist there. <laughs> yeah, he's very young indeed. We're going to start with Paladin versus Mage, by the way. Nylum already throwing a curveball starting oh, awesome. off with Paladin in the first match. I mean, it's, this is the unique classes uh, in terms of the differences of teams, right? Both teams have yeah. five classes that are similar, but they chose the one that they differentiate upon. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think there's, uh, there's some decision-making here. Um, I mean, we've seen from Archon... You know, quite a a varied uh, mage lineup in the past. Uh, even with players that weren't participating, they probably had some input in this tournament. So, you know, we might even see like uh, you know the type of mage that Orange plays. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And uh, Paladin, it, it's it's been pretty good. It's just a little bit underplayed. Um, so again, it allows for that just a little bit of room for creativity, that little bit of room of difference that uh, might be pretty exciting to see. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see Firebat whip out Freeze Mage here. I think if you can context of like how Freeze Mage is still really good in Conquest, even though there is a wide field of decks out there, it still is really powerful, given that if you ex expect aggro, Freeze Mage is one of the best decks at stopping that. And on the flip mm -hmm. side, we've been seeing this aggressive paladin really take shape on ladder a lot. Um, people were even playing yep. it at DreamHack. And, you know, to minor success, uh, it wasn't the most dominating deck, but it wasn't poor either. Um, yeah, do you have opinions on this deck? Um, It's pretty good. Um, it tends to do slightly better in tournaments than on ladder because um, it's kind of easy to ban what it sucks against, but yeah, it's a little bit different situation here. It's it's kind of hard to guess. Uh, mm -hmm. The matchups are pretty poor against uh, like the the Zui type of decks generally, because right. yeah, the, the Paladin minions are 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 pretty strong. But when you play so many smaller ones, you know, like an Imp Gang boss just chumps up so many cards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We already see a couple of interesting choices here, at least just on RDU's side, as uh, Firebat's view does make it indicate that he is playing Freeze Mage. So RDU kept Divine Favor, because I think he's really putting an easy read on Firebat to bring that Freeze Mage and normally draw his cards. Because Tempo Mage is often dumping their card hand to try to really control the yep. state of the board, especially against aggressive decks. So that's a really good read from RDU. Yep. Um, 
But now the deck's pretty figured out. We got Freeze Mage. And uh, RDU might not be too happy to see that. Yeah, one, one also interesting choice that we've been seeing develop in the Aggressive Paladin is the Argent Protector as well. I know some people who were originally playing this deck wasn't including it, but it's just so good because Divine Shields, turns out, are really impossible to deal with sometimes efficiently, especially yeah. if you're playing classes that have to double dip damage like Druid or Rogue. Um, so a lot of times the Argent Protector just really helps you secure it, even though you feel like, isn't that more of a board-oriented thing and not a face damage thing? You, you can protect your Wolf Riders, your Arcane Golems, and do massive damage. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same. When, when you play this type of deck, just putting on a Divine Shield while it is like a, a board control type of play, uh, that, that damage survives the turn. That's kind of the, that's kind of the idea behind it. Mm -hmm. play, play the zoo game, get your minutes to survive, get, you know, an attack, two, maybe three, and then and you're basically one. The, uh. the main difference with the, the Paladin deck as opposed to a lot of other uh, very aggressive decks is that it, it really lacks in the burst damage. Um, so you kind of have to rely on, if you're playing as the Freeze Mage, you have to rely on him drawing, like, pretty badly because he can just stall you out for so long normally. And, um, well... Let's just say Divine Favor is a good card to have in that case. Yeah. Well, he's got two Divine Favors. I mean, it's a little clunky. You prefer to have something you can dump easily in Abusive Sergeant and then go for Divine Favor. But I guess he's not complaining. He has his ultimate source of card draws. Firebat struggling a little bit, but it's not critical levels just yet. I mean, he does have some yeah. AoE, does have a Blizzard and Flame Strike in the next couple of turns. But ultimately, he still needs to find ways to pick up things like Ice Blocks. That way, Alex Straza can set up maybe a kill, or he needs ways to eventually stop this aggression from uh, being able to overwhelm him. So he goes with the board control play, which turns out to be much better, because not only does... Um it reduced the amount of damage next turn, but it denies RDU that extra card. Uh, I feel some players would have considered not playing Frostbolt and just setting up for a better Blizzard, and that would have been uh, a bit worse for him. Yeah, and the fact that RDU, again, picked up True Silver Champion a little clunky because it wouldn't allow him to play anything else. It is just damage to the face, and he picks up a second True Silver. So these, this is a lot of damage that he has over turns, but... He wants to just start pushing out a lot of damage soon. Like you said, this deck does end up struggling with burst sometimes, and you need that in order to threaten a, a deck like Freeze Mage because it can take its time in this scenario. I just feel like the, the True Silvers are actually the cards that you need um, because uh, the True Silver requires the, the Mage to use his Freeze inefficiently, which lowers the damage ceiling, which usually gives you an extra turn to push for damage. And... Um, I mean, you're never really going to have, like, that many extra creatures on the board. Like, if you hit, like, seven, you know, they're not going to get to attack. So, I think right now we're kind of at the stage where he's had... He has enough minions to where they're just not threatening enough to require Firebat mm. to, um, you know, deal with them as, as aggressively as possible. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, the, the way I see it is that I think... As much as this juice over is great and whatnot, I think uh, the key is really to be able to just pressure before the ice block really comes out here. Um, so, we, but the thing is that the Emperor Thorson is also even more threatening because of what Freeze Mage can do, reducing the mana. Oh man, that Doomsayer was a pretty nice draw there, here, Crip. Uh, it was. It was. Firebat decides to uh to stall out with it. Mm hmm. And it's important to stop any kind of charger from being able to come out here. Both owls have been used as well, so you can't silence his owl and then do a buff play. Mm -hmm. This is pretty all in, though. Um, like, he's going to have to Alistraza the Paladin, because that's the only chance he has of killing him. And if Alistraza can't push for damage, it probably will, but if, uh, if RDU draws some taunt or some way to deal with it, uh, it might be problematic, but if he doesn't get the Alistraza hit, it's going to be really hard to win. Yeah, it's interesting too because even though you have Alistraza hit plus a Fireball and Ping is 15, he has a True Silver, so he will actually heal out of lethal range for you. Yep. Um, so it's not even guaranteed that you can kill him. You need a little help off exactly. of the deck. Exactly, exactly. That's really the problem. Oh, wow. I bring okay. Yeah, this this is a really defensive play. I mean, he has a Mad Scientist as well, so whatever he pulls out, Ice Barrier or Ice Block will be super helpful. So I guess he's just going for a very defensive play here because he realizes he probably can't kill his opponent anyways. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, with one Frostbolt down, you're just drawn to the other Fireball. And you're hoping you're not getting uh, taunted. Which yeah, is, like which is a bit optimistic. Like, uh, yeah, there's, you already see, you already seen one Annoyatron. Um, and while I don't know exactly the current list that RDU is running, but we have seen some other taunts from this deck in the past. I think we've seen Argus, uh, sometimes like a one of. Mm -hmm. Okay, holding on to some of his buffs, it makes sense. You don't want the Abuse of Sergeant to just go down easily. Yeah. So I really think the Mad Scientist here is a big priority. I'm not sure if you'd want to freeze the face again, but I wouldn't blame him for feeling like necessary to do so. It's not even the fact that you're trying to stop the Light's Justice from hitting you, but again, mm. the threat of maybe the Chuso number two or Cog Hammer, those th weapons can be threats over time. Yeah. He actually uh, prevented lethal, by the way, with that flame strike. Because uh, King's, King's True Silver was actually lethal. Mm-hmm. So there's 17 damage next turn, and the Paladin has 19, so RDU is still safe in his mind. Uh, he can take this opportunity to develop minions, uh, but now it's, again, a little bit awkward. Freeze Mage is going on the offensive and it's all in, but RDU doesn't have exact ways to stop this easily. Yeah. Well, the only card here that, that really kills you is, uh, is Pyroblast. <laughs> and that's, I don't think that's really common anymore. Some people no. run like a one of, yeah. but even then, his only hey. answer for it would be to consecrate here, which seems terrible. Yeah, I mean he can also do it retroactively if his opponent decides to trade for some reason. But in this case, I can't imagine Firebat doing so. That ice barrier, though, yeah, oh, that's man. really big. I think so he actually he fireball the Lepernum. Yeah, Fireball and the Leopard Gnome seems a much better play, just because that way he doesn't have to use Alex Straza or even take the damage. And once again, shows lethal for next turn. Um, yeah, that's right. Mm, now that Divine Favor number two feels so useless, already wish he had something else here. Arjun Squire is not a good pickup, this so is such, that's going to end the game. This is such a weird situation. Like, If you imagine yourself as the Paladin, it's like... You know, how am I not playing Divine Favor against a Freeze Mage? How does he have zero cards? Yeah. It's like it's like those sometimes when you're playing Hunter against Handlock, Handlock's got like one card or two cards in their hand, they never can tap. It's, it feels like this weird scenario again where you have more cards than the control deck that's trying to stop your aggression. So this is a really uncomfortable spot. RDU, of course, knows that either that's Ice Barrier or Ice Block, and Doesn't either matter. way, it stops him from being able to do anything in this game. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't die next turn with the Consecrate, but he's basically dead. Like, um, this this power deck does not have uh, any capability to deal with Alastraza and gain life with one card, which is all he's getting next turn. Well, he might be able to pick something up that trades into Alastraza, and he has another two heal from True Silver. So it's not 100% guaranteed over next turn. But it's going to be tough because, I mean, Firebat has a lot of ways to draw cards into his burn, right? He has yet to pick up his Acolytes, his, his Arcane Intellect to draw more cards. I think he's actually he paying the dude. Uh, the 1-1, one, one, you mean? Yeah. It feels like that should be it because either way, he's uh, attacked with Chuso. That's all right. I think he's thinking about it. I don't think it really matters now that I keep looking at it. Interesting. We'll just agree with whatever Firebat does. Well, I think it matters if this Loot Hoarder can get in an attack. Yeah, but it's not going to. Mm, yeah, probably not. <laughs> and there's nothing else to do here. You can't uh, you can't take down Alex Straza. Uh, you unfortunately, you didn't pick yeah. up anything else. Blessing of Kings would have been great. Um, you Well, you can draw a card here. Oh, you're right. And I think so the card you need to draw is... Kings. Quality, right? No, it's the kings. I don't think equality nope. is in the deck. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some people have taken it in and out. It's always been cycling. Depends on what people read on the meta game, but yeah. that's gonna be it. And uh, Firebat takes the first game, despite RDU getting some of the key cards in this matchup in order to secure the victory. So Archon off to a great start. Yeah. Um. While uh, you know, I. 
I don't like to punish players for losing. I'm kind of glad that RDU lost because we'll get to see the Paladin again. Oh, it's is a good that good way to think it? about it, right? Yeah, it's, it's a good very way. optimistic of you. Yeah. Man, Crib, you've changed so much, man. You're <laughs> looking on the bright side of things now. Awesome. Yeah. All right, yeah, well, takes um, the lead. Um, it's, again, yeah. w you kind of mentioned a little bit uh, how the team dynamic maybe changes a little bit um, in terms of uh, the optimism of things. Um, I certainly know that in the past when we've cast, actually, the team tournaments uh, together that, you know, once the, once the teams start getting, like, two losses, the, some, mm -hmm. some teams just feel, like, completely demoralized. And, yeah. um, man... If that happens in the, in this tournament, it's it's going to be pretty tragic. Yeah, because there's there's a few dynamics to it. One, you're losing, so you, of course you're not happy with how the result is because you don't want to be you know losing to your opponents. The second thing is you're losing on behalf of your team, yeah. so then you're also letting down your teammates. And of course, the, you, it could be flipped the opposite way. You're losing, you did your part, but you're watching your teammates lose, and it's frustrating sometimes because it's like, no, you're you're not doing it right. So then sometimes there's a little bit of a uh, uh, this, you know, a little tension. dissent between the players. Yeah. yeah, tension. I remember Doggy House with like, you know, when Artosis was making mistakes and Ecop would just rip into him relentlessly all the time. And, um, you know, that was part of the fun for us to watch. But of course, Absolutely. the players themselves weren't enjoying it too much. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it runs. That's how it runs. Uh, all right. So uh, Archon gets the, the first point of the tournament. How about that? Um, now, I believe, I believe Firebat has to stay. Does he not? Uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's Conquest, right? So if Conquest is truly the format here in terms of the best of 11, uh, then it's that just, means it's blind pick. Any, they can yeah. send out anybody they want. Send anybody, yeah. And, it's about if you um, lose. And if you lose two, you get benched. That's the right. idea. Right. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. we'll follow that up, by the way, with I believe the classes are actually aligned to the player. Um, the mages belong to the fire bat and then paladin to RD. So that's my mistake earlier. Don't, I just want to clarify that. Okay. It could just be a wild coincidence if we're just going off the graphic here. That that, that would be pretty sick. But I mean, it, it does make sense. You know, Tice on Druid, Zelay on Warrior, yeah, Six O on Hunter. I guess no, Six O is more of a rogue player than he Life is, Coach so, on yeah. Warlock and Warrior. That's pretty telling. Yeah, yeah. All it all makes sense. I know Ardu also really loves Hunter. For some reason, Ardu's favorite matchup in all of Hearthstone is Hunter versus Hunter, no matter what oh. version it is. Like if it's face versus face, mid range versus mid range, etc. He loves it. Maybe it's one of those like. Uh, you know, torture systems where, you know, you can hate <laughs> it, and then if you do it enough, you do it enough, you kind of get used to it. Yeah, like yeah, drinking I, I, beer. I, I, I kind of like Hunter vs. Hunter. Yeah, it's a cool matchup. Yeah. There is there's <laughs> actually guess. a decent amount of strategy when it comes to, like, you know, uh, like squeezing every single point of damage. So I, wow. I, can, kind of, uh, I can kind of understand that. Um, it does feel that even though, you know, Hunter may seem a bit simplistic. It's usually the case that Hunter is matched up against like a slow control deck where mm -hmm. the Hunter just plays out every card from hand and points face and hopes for the best. Uh, but against another aggressive... Oh my god! What, what is that? Are uh, we, are we watching Dragon Ball Z? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Or a, a really old school kung fu movie. Life Coach has got that, uh, that, that Mr. Miyagi look right now, man. On six, so yeah. he's got. Is that a legend crystal? Because he always gets first every season. All right. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cute. Idea. I like it. I like it. Yep. Man, all all these smooth skinned archon players, all these kids, man. Yeah, they're, they're trying. They're trying to pitch them as like the young up and comers, and uh, okay. pile them as like the the old established you know vanguard that they got to destroy. Oh, is it, is it like villains versus the new good guys? Supposedly, I mean, just look at that milky white complexion on six. So he's, he's innocent. He's innocent. He looks like he's actually a, a student of Hogwarts with this picture. Wow. Yeah, just Does he about. Not? Yeah, but he's it, found uh, the sorcerer stone crib. Yeah, yeah. It is life coach on warrior six on hunter. So uh, again, it does seem like the classes um, are attributed to uh, the players, uh, as as I had originally guessed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, looking good for life coach, I believe. Um, this this matchup can go either way, but I think uh, I think Life Coach has played Warrior enough, and I think it's really on the Warrior to make like the very correct plays to do well yeah. in this match. Uh, the Hunter just kind of plays that game where you play stuff and throw it in his face most of the time. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there is a dynamic where Hunter sometimes tries to make Warrior uncomfortable with the way they line up their threats. But for the most part, you're absolutely right. Warrior has to make the reads. They have to know what removal to line up. And more importantly, uh, what kind of Warrior is Life Coach playing? Because, you know, for people who are tuning into Hearthstone, they're still kind of new to the players and their styles. There's a reason why Life Coach is holding a rope that burns down. And I'm really worried if he plays something like Patron Warrior because I know Life Coach is also a guy that brings decks that he practiced relentlessly, but it's always scary to watch him play decks that also require a lot of thought and, more, more importantly, time to execute. Yeah, that's true. Um, but also I feel like the matchup against the, the Hunter, um, while experience is really, really important, um, I feel like those types of like, ridiculous decisions are still fairly rare. But at the same time, uh, Blizzard did change the the turn timer from 90 to 70 seconds, and that was fairly recent. I don't know if Life Coach has played many tournaments since that. Yeah, I believe it was last fall they changed it, like right after Next Ramus release. That's when they ninja nerfed it or buffed it, whatever you want to consider. Oh, really? I thought it was more yeah. recent than that. No, no, no. Someone, someone noticed it recently, made a big oh. fuss, and apparently, like they, they clarified, they tweet at Ben Brode and Zariah, and then they're like, "No, it actually has been in since like Next Ramus." Okay, um, never mind. Then. Not exactly sure yeah. why they didn't. I don't think they clarified, but I think it, I'm not I think complaining. Cool. I don't usually require ninety seconds. Like that, that would be the, that would be the, the nerf to Grim Patron Warrior. You know, you just stealth nerf the turn timer by twenty seconds in one patch. Huh? Pretty good stuff. All right, well, um, I think we're going to uh, get into this matchup pretty soon. Looks like Froden has abandoned me. I'm all alone here. Looking at Life Coach and Sixo's art. Yep. All right, hello, can you hear me? Yep. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Uh, Skype had a, a mini hiccup. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently, Life Coach has a problem selecting his deck, so uh, we're, we're just in the middle of stuff here. So yeah. I apologize for the delay. Uh, in the meantime, though, I uh, do want to talk about... Um, other stuff here happening with the Archon Team League. You just want to remind you guys that's going to be going on for eight weeks, so hope you guys get comfortable. We're also going to have a broadcast tomorrow. Uh, are you casting tomorrow, Crip, by any chance? Uh, I don't think I am. No, I don't think okay. so. I am. Uh, yeah. Both of us are going to be back and forth uh, casting one here, one there. That's right. Um, I think we're both casting the majority of them, but with so many tournament dates, um, you know, we're not quite able to get through all of them. Yeah, we have other guys like Monk from Team Liquid who's going to be hopping on. Uh, I believe Wreckful yeah, will be fact, hopping on and casting too. You're casting with Wreckful tomorrow. Oh, am I? Okay, yep. that's great. And I mean, I, I was. Tomorrow's match is going to be the other teams. It's going to be uh, Force and Boys versus Tempo Storm and okay, uh, cool. Celestial versus Team Liquid. Oh, that should be really fun then. Really yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I haven't actually heard Wreckful cast since Lord of the Arena. I'm not sure if he's been doing anything since then in terms of hearthstone casting and we also have some players also hopping in uh to be doing some casting too throughout the weeks i know a lot of people were like well i really like chalky's casting and i really enjoy when gara hops in the mic i believe those guys will be rotating in and out um you know as well as amaz who also uh is basically spearheading this entire initiative as well mm -hmm. so he'll be rotating into yeah that's right i actually don't see chalky on this list but uh i hope he comes around he's uh he's been doing a pretty good job recently Absolutely. All right. Well, it looks like we at least got one POV, and that is Sixo, the Hunter player. He's got an opening hand that indicates that he might be more of the face hunter, although yeah. you never can be truly too sure nowadays. That's a little bit of a letdown. I, I feel like this, this match from the... Uh... Oh, there we go. We do get to see the warrior POV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, I think this match from the warrior side is uh, really the more interesting one. Oh, so you're just saying you wanted to be on uh, Life Coach's POV. Is that what it was? Yeah, but we, we get it anyway. <laughs> it's good. It's good. All right. So uh, the Frothing Berserker means he's playing either Math Warrior or Grim Patron Warrior, and you'd be crazy to play Math Warrior these days without Grim Patron. 
So uh, if you're playing Patron Warrior, you got some of the combo cards, you got the Armor Smith, you got the double axe to stop the aggression. I think you're in you're in really good shape here. Yeah, it's not bad at all. Now, Life Coach chose to play the War Axe from the left, uh, but for all intents and purposes, Six will assume that his opponent will be trying to keep other cards like Death Spite too. And that Armor Smith will be really key because the thing about Fire War Axe is it's great to get board position and stop aggro, but you still take a lot of damage. Um, especially if they put out Animal Companion, like anything that comes out of it, Fire War Axe can't deal with it very effectively without taking a lot of damage back. So this Armor Smith will be super key. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, he's uh, considering dropping the frothing this turn. I think uh, sometimes uh, players drop like the charger here and it's totally a mistake. But um, I think the armor smith and the frothing are both pretty good plays. I like the frothing though, much more aggressive. But again, it, it kind of gets stopped by, uh, by the Misha. No Misha though. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. In this case, Sixo has... Slightly awkward turn. Um, the best way to deal with the frothing, you, well, you don't want it to get out of control because that's certainly a card that can <laughs> punish you heavily with so many ways to remove a one health minion and start stacking more damage back at yourself. Yeah, um, but, like how do you get rid of that? I yeah, mean, the only real way is Arcane Golem, and the only thing worse than leaving a frothing is giving a mana crystal to a Grim Patron combo warrior. I guess yeah, you just exactly. Silence and keep going. I guess so. It's. Really awkward, like we're saying, but probably the best in this scenario to take care of it. But now this there's is, uh, there's a board clear a available. Yeah, yeah. This, this is pretty easy, I feel. You drop the armor smith, you uh, attack with a weapon first, and then uh, grab an armor point, killing the uh, killing one of the creatures with the frothing. I wonder how important it is to maintain health and... Like versus keeping the inner rage here, because the inner rage does effectively gain you a couple points of health, but more importantly keeps you know your frothing more health also, so that way it doesn't have to take you know die to explosive traps or a weapon hit from an eagle horn bow. But if he did have the eagle horn bow, maybe he would have also taken out that frothing berserker last turn. So yeah, there's a lot like, there's a lot of things going through like coach's mind if, right now. If he has explosive traps, then that's totally fine because you have a grim patron in hand. Oh yeah, that's true. Took Grim Page in on turn five, so you can just get that extra copy right immediately. Yeah. I mean, you also do can get to armor up too if you use this inner rage, but it depends on how he wants to stylize it too, because the Fiery War Axe doesn't necessarily have the biggest impact for uh, normal stuff against mid range warriors starting from like the later turns, but against face warriors, it's always live. You could always kill whatever comes out. Okay, well, he uses the inner rage there. Pretty interesting turn, actually. Yeah, he did like a halfway point that. between both of the plays that we were talking about. So he still conserved his health on himself, but he let his Frothing Berserker take the damage so that way he can gain an armor point here. And then more importantly, he started attacking the face with the Fiery War Axe, right? Yeah. Well, Sixo drew his second trap, or second explosive trap. That's very unlucky, considering that he already has one, and he'd rather be able to play a threat or start racing. But now that this explosive trap will gain uh, three health for his opponent and be able to clone um, a Grim Patron here, this is really tight here for Sixo at the moment. Yeah, Sixo is just starting to fall uh, massively behind. He's got quite a bit of burst, but he's uh, he's not really in position to rely on it. Uh, he still has to get a lot more damage through, and that's just so hard to do at this point. Mm -hmm. Actually, I actually don't see how anything's really going to happen from the hunter side. Well, I mean, never say never. If there's enough Grim Patrons onto the board or like things on the board, the Unleash the Hounds get stronger. You can pick up major damage through kill commands or quick shots combinations. And I mean, you, it's like you said, there is damage in the hand. Um, but I, I don't really foresee it being that big of an issue considering this armor smith will continue to stay alive. And there's really no incentive for Life Coach to attack into um, the explosive trap unless he wants to be aggressive. I kind of like can... the, the ghoul and armor up play. Yeah, and then passing. Yeah, and just developing more creatures just to maximize the armor throughout the game. Your opponent had... Five mana. Well, okay, he had three mana after playing the Explosive Trap, and he couldn't play anything, and it's pretty clear that your opponent's playing more, the more aggressive variant of Hunter. Yeah. So, 
you have to anticipate that your opponent might be holding cards that can damage you back. Okay, well, Life Coach continues the aggression. He there is a train of thought. He gets the off of this, and uh, you get the push for six. Yeah, um, and there is a train of thought, too, that you can play defensive against Hunter all you want, but eventually you have to find out a way to kill him, too. Um, yeah. This is why, like, for example, sometimes if you play a combo deck like Maligos Warlock, you can play defensive with all these implosions and hellfire stuff, or you can sometimes be super aggressive, hit face, and try to race them with your own burn. And uh, I think Life Coach might be looking at that. He's saying, I'm at a comfortable enough health that I don't have to be super defensive and give time for Hunter to draw into good cards, and I can just probably pressure for the win in a couple turns. Well, Sixo here has an opening to deal with these Grim Patrons, but... Uh because they were on the board for a while, and because Grim Patron Warrior has Battle Rage, well, uh, it doesn't matter as much that he can clear them, but it looks like he's probably going to. I mean, he has to trade! He has to trade against the Patron Warrior here in order to stay alive. Not quite. Well, I mean, I meant the sense that he couldn't leave that Warsong Commander up there, because it's just too much of a threat. Yeah. Um, I think this is a pretty good uh, execute whirlwind turn. Yeah, and he leaves. You know, he doesn't get super greedy and plays a second acolyte, which is mm -hmm. very understandable considering that. Oh, I'm surprised. Up I'm surprised he didn't attack first with the grim patron. Though he could have gotten another. Uh, he could could have gotten two more patrons actually. Oh, uh, oh, you mean hit into the one one? Yeah, hit into the one one, then whirlwind. That gives you two more patrons. Yeah, and he already just used Unleash the Hounds, right? So it's unlikely that he has a second one. In fact, a lot of people are cutting Unleash the Hounds and just saying, I'll have one at most. It's a good observation, Crit. <laughs> like a life coach right now. <laughs> yeah, I can't oh, tell man. if life coach is the one losing if you just judge by the faces. <laughs> it's, that, it's, that, it's that smooth uh, Archon complexion, man. Just throws you off guard. If only life coach could see Sixo now. Well, he's going to defeat him and steal his uh, his potion of youth or whatever it is that's the secret to keeping him so young looking. Mm -hmm. uh, how much damage is this? Uh, it's 7, 9, so uh, a few damage points trying short. trying to get lethal. Yeah. yeah. Not yet. You can still go for it. You can Cruel Task the Acolyte. Um, 5, though, that's kind of hard. Like, how do you get five in one card? I don't think you do. Uh, the most you can probably get is Death Spite and then Inner Rage. Those yeah, are like the... Yeah, yeah. I just don't don't think you're getting lethal this turn. Okay. There's, there's, there's no, like, one card lethal draw. Are you worried about your opponent lethaling you at all? Mm, not really. I think you're comfortable enough. Okay, cool task to copy another Grim Patron. Running out of time though, Life Coach has to play this unstable ghoul and armor up quickly in order to pass the turn here. He gets it though, it looks good. Okay, well he got the Death Spite, so he's got four damage from the hand. Yeah. But uh, this is looking like a, a victory here for Life Coach. Sixo ran out of explosive traps, so he can't even stop this aggression next turn. So he probably run out of traps altogether, yeah. Yeah, and that means Life Coach evens up the series at one apiece. But, I mean, the series is just getting started. It's a best of 11, Grip. We're, we're in here for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it mostly had to do with uh, the great opener that Life Coach got. Um, there wasn't too much that Sixo could do with uh, what he had. Um, opening up with a coin knife juggler, you know, leaves you really vulnerable to a few cards. And, uh, well... Life Coach had all those cards, so didn't really work out for six though, and uh, it it is evened up as you mentioned. Um, yeah, the life gain and the the board control through the weapons was too much, and plus you know six had awkward draws too. Yeah. All right, so Life Coach has gotten the Warrior uh, out of the way here. Remember, this is Conquest to win with every deck, which means you're only as strong as your weakest player. Or weakest deck. Let's 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 go ahead and put it that way. Let's not let's not put the pressure too much on the players themselves here. Um, I'm just thinking back. 
Wasn't RDU supposed to like stay? Uh, no, it's Conquest, man. Everything is blind pick. Every game. Every game is blind pick. Okay. In Conquest, right? So it's as if you switch decks, but the decks are tied to a player. It's not like Life Coach and be like, "Well, I, RDU, you know, yeah, maybe yeah, you're yeah. bad with Paladin. I'll play Paladin." Like you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Plus, uh, he won't do that because he's a gentleman. Yeah, the the bench rule is as if you know one player just tries too hard and it just doesn't work. I guess. That's the idea. Yeah, I think it's that way you can't just like queue up. Like if Firebat was losing with Freeze Mage repeatedly, you can't just queue up five games in a row with Freeze Mage and just try to just win it out of the way. You tank it? Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. So it, should do, it forces some variety onto the teams. You know, so that, okay. way, mm-hmm. that way you save the embarrassment and also the Ghost Who Gamer ranking points so you don't just go 0 5. Well, this is going to be a really weird tournament to rank in that sense. Uh, yeah, I guess it's just solely based off your individual series performance that you get your, your points. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I wonder if the players are going with the dice roll or if we're going to see um, some decks from the remaining players. Maybe we'll see dice versus uh, Zelai coming up. That would be pretty interesting. I'm always uh, pretty happy to see Tice play Druid. Uh, there's there's mm-hmm. always some like crazier aggressive way to play a druid that I didn't think was possible that Tice always shows me that is every single time I see him play. So that's it's, it's pretty cool. Um druid is one of those classes that can win against everything but some players seem to have just a surprising amount of consistency with. Tice is one of those players. After um, after these two teams uh, battle off today, of course we have uh, Value Town versus Cloud Nine right after, and uh, we'll get to see their lineup. We'll get to see their decks uh, tomorrow. We'll see uh, the remaining uh, the remaining teams, and uh, across these two days, you'll get to see uh, all the players, all the decks, all the classes, and um, really we can we can start shaping up the the competition at that stage. We'll probably get into this game here in uh, in just a second. Oh man, I wish Fred was here to see this. We got Tyson. Oh, I'm, I'm like... here. I'm oh, here. Welcome. I'm back. Whoa! Yeah, but, yeah. What is this? Tice is Tarzan. Yep. And wait, no, Zelay is tar wait, Zelay is King Mukla. What is going on? <laughs> oh god. Why is he what what's with the rubber ducky? I, I don't know, man. It's that it's that twisted smile that's just it's yeah. just kinda getting me right now. I feel a little bad too because you know, Firebat and Sixo looked kinda cute, you know, like in a innocent boy way, but now Zelay looks really creepy comparatively. You think the ducky and, is never I mean, never like rubber it? Duck- Never Something's going on. Deck. This is an inside joke at the Archon house that we are not aware of right now, Crib. Okay. Well, they're probably getting some pretty good kicks out of it. And it involves some bath toys. Or does it? Meanwhile, uh, Tice, he's going to be bringing his druid here up against Warrior. Zelay, almost certainly going to be bringing Patron Warrior. Um, it's, it's a deck that he's fallen in love with since the moment it, it dropped in Black yep. Rock Mountain. And he's been playing it to top legends on multiple servers simultaneously. I think he was holding number one and number two uh, in Europe. All, all the Archon players were uh, around there. They were really trying to push for those ladder points. Yeah, it's true. They were like, you know, they were also doing streams where they were like partnering up and playing ladder and just talking through plays and stuff. So it was like, you know, 6-0 um, he was also top legend, but then Zelay and Purple Drink were also doing big pushes too. Yeah, they, they, the Archon guys really like to uh, collectively do well on ladder at the same time. If you've seen some some of the tweets, you know they got the, they got the one two three four. Sometimes have you seen that mm-hmm. one? Yeah, it's pretty fun, pretty fun to look at. It uh, was. It's they're certainly like extremely dedicated um, because I mean it just just you know being at that spot, it's like yeah, of course you have to be pretty good. All these players are pretty good. Um, you really just have to put in so many games. You have to be so composed in all of them, and 
and really be at the top of your game. I agree. When are you, when are you going to make the big push, Crip? To the top ends of Legend. When are you going to start tryharding, huh? You just have to, you have to make it worth it. I feel like the reward system's pretty, pretty lackluster right now. I must protect. Gotcha. Well, do you have the card back? Nope. Well, there's one incentive at least. Yeah. All if right. you're gonna go for every golden card in the game, you have to get every card back too, right? Yeah, um, maybe one day. And you have the most valuable account in Hearthstone. It'll there's no way that I do. There's people who spent like tens of thousands of dollars on like every single card already. Yeah, but the card backs though. The card backs. Uh, I still don't have too many good ones. Like I don't, I don't have the the Dalar and Flame. I think the best card back in the game is actually the like the Chinese exclusive one. It's like a full golden yeah. regular one. I don't even so know how you get cool. that, but I'm you have I'm to like, so you jelly have to jelly. Fly to China and go into their, one of their open tournaments in order to get that card back. Is it still available? Uh, I think so. I think it's available to every season they have the open tournaments. So. But can you actually activate that on like a U.S. account? Like, can you go there and play with a U.S. account? I'm sure there's ways to finagle it. There has to be because it shows in your card collection. So there's got to be a way. That maybe they give you the code. It could just be something that you know they're going to push at a later time. Possibly. Wow. Well, uh, looks like Tice is about to buy some packs right now. Uh, yeah, perhaps so. Or is that Zelly? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Tice is the Druid player, right? Yeah, right, right, right. So Zelly's about to buy some packs right now. <laughs> well, we were trying to practically get him back in here, but uh, this Wild Growth start is really key for Tice in order to get started here, just because the, the Druid needs to be able to threaten the Patron Warrior with minions, and this Innervate and the Wild Growth combination will allow him to seize the board. Although... He still needs a way to fill out the curve. He's got a turn four Sylvanas and like a turn five BGH ish, but he still needs a little bit of help so that way he could make it even smoother. Mm hmm. Do you think there's some merit to just drop the BGH and innervate the Ancient Allure the following turn because of the clunkiness? Yeah, actually, that's, that might even be much better considering that um, Speak to me. you really need to fill out this hand. And make that make sure that wild. Goes. Oh no, that's perfect. There okay. you go. <laughs> with with that draw, I think the innervate Sylvanas is pretty clear. Normally, Sylvanas is punished uh, uh, by silence, but I guess in this case, well, he quite not the acolyte. So, yeah, he wouldn't be able to pump out a weapon. It would have to be like an inner rage fiery war axe counter to it. Mm -hmm. That would have to be it. I don't think there's anything else than that. Yeah, and, and normally that's another way you can deal with Sylvanas. You can try to just remove your entire board, but I think it's important for the warrior, if he had Inner Rage, to also consider saving it. Even though it might feel like you want to use the Inner Rage to get rid of the Sylvanas immediately, the thing is that if you have Death Spite and you have a Grim Patron in hand, the really powerful thing to do on turn 5 is to go for a Grim Patron, Inner Rage, and then a Whirlwind effect. Because then Druid can't answer it. They don't. They have Swipe, but even then that creates another Grim Patron. Mm -hmm. Well, this is interesting too, going for the immediate big game Hunter to try and uh, bump into this Acolyte. More Pax? He's to get punished. Pax? Pax? What now? He's got, he's got zero packs, Crip. He has to play Tavern Brawl first uh, and then play a bunch of Web Spinner decks and then get the free packs and open them. Okay, okay. Oh, it looks like he has the Inner Rage. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's pretty indica indicative that his hand's rather poor, I think. Um, really? Or either late game oriented. That just feels like a good one. Like, you, you threaten a 5 4 frothing on the board against the Druid who's got nothing. Um, but it also could just get answered by swipe or wrath. Like you would hear power down and wrath. Uh, I, I guess, yeah, but maybe you, you'd right. still have board control then. Swipe or wrath is fine. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. You'd, you'd still be winning. Personally, I just, like, it just means that he probably doesn't have any way to snap the board because it's not even necessarily more about the uh, the pressure on Druid a lot of times. Well, I, I guess it does in, t in the sense that you can threaten damage. But again, I think the Grim Patrons are just so powerful. Um, if you can get them out early and you use those combo pieces early to flood the board. So, yeah, Druid really, really struggles you know. to remove those patrons often. 
The Druid has to be like kind of winning to kind of prevent the patron play altogether. Mm-hmm. So usually when you see patron, the warrior is not in that situation, and you just he just wins from there. And a little bit down there, you can't see the warrior POV. It's, we we can tell that Zele is really thinking about something here. Um, Turn four is pretty much death by setup. So if he like hits the face with it because he doesn't have anything else, or he's in a rage. Second. All right, there it is. And his opponent just used big game hunter. So yeah, there's not that's much a salty dog. Can do here. That is a salty dog, but for a three mana that gets bigger. Nerf, please. Yeah. Um, really here it just has to be Sylvanas, I guess. Yeah, well, are you taking too much damage? You might even consider just tossing in a force of nature. No, you have the combo in hand. Like, how do you win if you do that? You're, like, you're timed against this warrior deck. That's fair, but then also, what if you might just take too much damage, though? But then, how does he deal with Sylvanas? I guess uh, he just lets you, he just does damage and then lets uh, lets you pick up the bad trade. Okay, well he goes with the force of nature. Yeah, Tice is scared, and rightfully so. That berserker is easily a way to get out of control with a death spite activated. I, I don't trust him at all. Yeah, it's just with five mana, it's hard to play much and combo much. That's why it's <laughs> like not really that bad. Yeah. Um, I'll look, another one. Armor made to fit. And armor smith. So it would have been four more. It would have been 11 plus four. He would have been at eight life. Yeah, okay, that would have sucked. <laughs> well, that's one way to describe the situation. And this situation is not that much better either. Normally, you want to disarm the despite as soon as you can. So that way, Warrior can't get the optimal timing with its Whirlwind effect release. But Harrison Jones on this board is not very strong either, considering that Father Berserk is already out there, and you buff it up once again to a pretty yeah, high nice. proportion of damage. How's it going? Let me get that mind at work. Um, yeah, again, Sylvanas, I guess. I have no time mm -hmm. for Yeah, let it your opponent like deal with it. Yeah, like if you're not playing aggressively as the druid, um, you're really you're really just playing whatever. It's like I hope he doesn't have this. I hope he doesn't have that. And that mm -hmm. type of game, uh, Thice has not been doing so well so far. In yeah, this Sylvanas is a disincentive against um, Soleil from oh, no. like doing a huge amount of Grim Patron. Well, I mean, if he does do a Grim Patron, he'll do damage. But then Sylvanas will help control the state of the board a little bit. And then maybe he can have a better impact with Harrison Jones in the next turn if the opponent doesn't play anything and he keeps a death spite. Well, if you have Grimpation, what can you really do with it outside of just Whirlwind? Oh, I guess, I guess Grimpation Whirlwind's it then. Yes. And he's just going to hope that his opponent steals the Armor Smith. One and four. I believe that the effect triggers before Sylvanas steals something, right? Yes, it does. Yeah, because the damage happens and then it's, um... Wow. wow, I guess he's probably sitting with Execute in hand, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second Force of Nature. So there's still combo threaten um, potential in the next couple of turns, but now Tice is introduced to a couple of options here. He none, none are not too good, though, again. Yeah, um... The Emperor Thorson allows him to uh, reduce the cost of some of these expensive, clunky cards. But I wouldn't mind also developing though. Azure Drake, though. Mm. I mean, again, this is this is exactly like the last few turns. Just like, okay, I'll slam down Emperor Thorson. If he stays alive, maybe I could do something with combo. If he doesn't, well, I guess I'm screwed. And, uh, yeah, it's just... It just... I don't know, it feels like... Zele is just playing his own game, and Tice is just trying to stay alive. Yeah, although, like, say Zele hits all face and plays minions, though, that's exact lethal with combo damage. Um, because he's at 21 health, and 21 plus... Actually, he can do 22 damage, because of the hero power. 
Yeah. So, uh, Zule has to not get complacent to here. And he needs oh. to deal with this door soon. That armor he has puts out of range and gives him an extra card that gives him a, two more points of armor here. Clears the board. That's rough, man. Oh, wow, another whirlwind. Second whirlwind. Wow. Now, I wonder if you're contemplating trying to survive by using combo to clear these Grim Patrons. But I mean, the Warriors that's just, just 28. Actually. That's just so insane. Oh, wow, he picked up Swipe. Now he has um, a way to kill the board with Azure yeah, Drake. That, that was swipe. so big. Yeah, I just realized. I'm like, well, that swipe doesn't really work. But yeah, with spell damage, it certainly works. It just feels yeah, like this, this doesn't happen so frequently anymore. No, I mean, back in the day, druids used to rely on spell power swipe a lot. They even had Thaunos in the deck. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, they favor, you know, tempo as opposed to, I guess, that synergy with the Thanos and the swipe. It's kind of weird why you never see it so frequently, though, because I think Azure Drake is really pretty standard in, in Druid. Yeah, people don't really play Spectre Knights anymore at all. I saw it yesterday on HPL with Kranich, but you know, he's, he, he, was, he does weird stuff because he tries to surprise his opponent every time. Generally speaking, yeah. Azure Drake's the most standard option. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, it used to be the case where you couldn't use Azure Drake because you had Spectrals Sludge Belchers and Drew the Claws. You just couldn't yeah. have like another five drop. Do you think it can make its way back? By the way, the second Savage War was really nice too, so we can fit a double Savage War combo. Oh, yeah. But um, do you think Spectre Knight will make a way back in the minigame? Because I feel like sometimes it's still really strong against the spell heavy stuff. Like you can't execute it easily. Uh, most classes can't deal with it very effectively. Um, yeah, I think. I think at its peak, it was really just a really big punish for uh, for the rogue decks that were playing, you know, spell heavy mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. These days, I don't see it as such a direct counter anymore. But um, yeah. I mean, we'll certainly see it pretty soon if that's the case. But I don't think that's quite the case. Yeah, and um, well, I mean, we we don't have to worry too much about that because the threat is is super real right now. Like, Zelay is going to die to a two Savage War plus Forest of Nature on at least what the Shade should guarantee. Because um, a lot of these decks, they don't really run Brawl in their Grim Patron Warrior. A few people do try to experiment with it, like Savit from Team Liquid, but it's generally not standard at all. And he already used two Whirlwinds plus two Death Spikes. There's no way he can get rid of that Shade next round. So, unless this Doomsayer comes out of... No, that's uh, it. Yeah. It has to be Doomsday. <laughs> How about and that? And that's it. This ridiculous uh, aggression draws from the Druid deck just makes it happen. Zelle is probably going to be really surprised here. Well, I think he's also died to it fair enough. I think he'll be more, uh, you know, not happy with that. <laughs> oh, God. No reaction, though. That's to be so fair, insane. uh... Zelay's played a lot of uh, you know Magic the Gathering online. He was actually the player of the year a couple of years back. And if you grind so much, you've had to play a lot and deal with a lot, you know. So he's probably good at keeping his emotions in check in order to keep going here. Man, that was pretty brutal. Yeah. Zelay just felt like he was winning and Tice just surviving. But I mean, when you draw the right. combos, just one turn was enough to take it all back. And uh, Tice takes it, puts an extra point on uh, on Nylum's board, and Nylum is uh, is ahead now, two to one, I believe. That's right. But it's the first to six because it's a best of eleven. So we're one hour into the broadcast, guys, but we have plenty more action. Of course, we're gonna have uh, another match after this as well. It's not the the only best of eleven that we have. Yeah, I talked about a little bit when you uh, when you dropped it earlier. It is uh, we're we're gonna see the other the other quarter of the tournament. Uh, so today we're going to go over half of the teams, and uh, tomorrow is going to be the other half. Right now we're doing Nylum versus Team Archon. Uh, coming up after this, we'll have Value Town versus Cloud9. And the schedule for tomorrow is the other teams, Force and Boys versus Tempo Storm and Celestial versus Team Liquid. Yeah, and um, I'm looking forward to it. I just want to see how the styles match up. I also want to more, more importantly see if Specialists can finally come out of the work woodwork. You know, we've been talking about it for a while about some people really liking classes that 
Yeah, you know, it's very weird. Uh, for example, Hawkeye did really well in DreamHack with Shaman. He went 7-0 in Swiss with a mid-range Shaman deck, not like a Mech Shaman that mm -hmm. people are expecting. Or some people sometimes doing well with Priest, like Kalento. You know, can can they bring that? I, I'm really curious to see that. Um, yeah, I, I'm hoping to see Adventurous decks too. I think the the format encourages and punishes it. Uh, being conquest, but you know it is, it is six classes, so you kind of have a little bit more room than normal. I, I don't know. I think the surprise factor is pretty real. I think um, with the team dynamic, you know, you can you can get pretty punished. You can get pretty demoralized by just outrageous stuff. So I'm hoping to see it. Uh, I don't think we'll see too much of it in this matchup, but so far, just pretty solid Hearthstone. Sounds good. Uh, do we know the next players that we have coming up here on stream? Well, um, I don't know if it was by accident, but we we sequenced uh, in seeing every single player uh, so far. We kind of got got a little bit of a sneak peek of what they were bringing. Uh, Artie is going to try Paladin again, and Six is going to try Hunter again. So Ooh. we have uh, we have two losers up against each other, and uh, one will get their first point. Two losers. Wow, Crib shots fire. We have Hunter versus. <laughs> Well, what people perceive to be Face Hunter V2, um, but I guess the better way to describe it is... Um, is it know, just the same Face path. Hunter? Yeah, well, I mean, what the fact is... about it? Well, no, no, I meant uh, the Paladin often functions as like another aggressive deck. Oh, okay. It's like, if you want to bring a Conquest lineup that can really punish with aggro, you'd bring like Face Hunter, you'd bring sometimes maybe Mech Shaman or something, and then you always wonder like, what's the third deck I can bring that's super face-oriented? Mm -hmm. uh, Paladin's one of those decks you can also bring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it didn't quite uh, work its magic against the uh, Freeze Mage of Firebat, but um, that was just a really weird game. Firebat played that so aggressively, uh, with like no cards, no backup, just completely all in on the Alistraza hitting face three times, but I mean it did, so we took it. Very weird game. All right, here we go. Unleash the Hounds again. Um, I mean, you were mentioning that you know it it may be uh, it may be out of the cycle, but uh, we've seen it drawn quite a few times already. So maybe there's in fact uh, more than just the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it would be really useful against Paladin, especially with how many one health minions that they usually create. Divine Shield minions, yeah. Yeah, that also is, comes into play too. RD starts off with an Argent Squire, though, and that's going to immediately present problems because the Paladin is really good at controlling the state of the board, especially with, you know, Knife Juggler, Muster for Battle, Consecration. Those things will really help control the state of the board. Who do you, who do you favor here? I, I feel like the Hunter ultimately just has the better hero power that lines up in terms of the racing. You know, even though the one ones do end up stacking up, they can be liabilities for Unleash the Hounds. Mm -hmm. Um. No, I just have to do the opening hands, and right now I think I prefer the the paladins. Yeah, monster is just insane. If the opponent didn't have the explosive trap, but there's also the the blessing of kings this turn too. Yeah, the blessing of kings is all right. Mm. It stops three damage, but you still take a bit extra, uh, and you can get owled. In fact, you're going to get owled. So. Yeah, the Consecrate is really the play that clears the board. Yeah, but Consecrate on a board like that doesn't feel as powerful compared to... Like, for example, if you play Muster for Battle and then they have Unleashed the Hounds but they somehow clear the board or something like that, it's really good as a way to make sure that it's a response to a card that you I wonder feel if like... Six Lego's face here. Okay, good. You're, you're, you're certainly quite eager to keep going face when you're playing that Hunter deck. But mm. if you go face there, you get totally wrecked by Consecrate. I mean, you, you're never going to really push for another point of creature damage. <laughs> That's a really bad spot to be in when your opponent's at 25, also playing an aggressive deck against you. I yeah, and these small points of damage do end up making a difference here. You know, if RDU ends up going face or ends up trading against his Iron Beak Owl, like these type of things uh, ultimately might decide the outcome based off of the little bits of damage here. Mm -hmm. I like the face hit there. You might be tempted to trade, but if you if you don't trade, you kind of push for more damage next turn. This is really a battle of uh, 
you know, one player trying to be ahead of the other uh, on the board to get that free damage in. I think Zix says he might trade for that. I, I'd be surprised to see if he uh, trades here, though. He does trade. Wow. Oh. Wow, he really doesn't trust the Paladin to have anything on board. I mean, Paladin, a lot of their deck um, synergy is dependent on having a board. They have Blessing of Kings. They have Cog Hammers. They have Abusive Sergeants. Yeah, I mean, I guess since you've started trading, I, mean, I, guess, I guess you might as well just finish it up there. Yeah, this is really interesting that the, both of these really super aggressive decks end up just going for board control here so, you know, very early on. All right, so he picks up this Arcane Golem, ends up just going for a board clear and playing this Argent Squire, but now it's kind of like the race is again starting, or like the game is starting, and Hunter's way ahead in the health totals, and that's a really scary place because now you're going to have to play board okay. control and Hunter's free to go face. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you were wet. You were like seven points ahead, but with the hunter having uh, initiative with a the charger there, that does Ooh. change it quite a bit. Struggle is going to be so big if it hits the um, the wolf rider. That allows him to get four damage to face more. No, just just one. Wouldn't you want to put the? You don't, yeah, you I don't guess have to right. buff the divine shield. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You're right. I, it, it feels much better though because of things like oh yeah trap. exactly it feels much better that's true yikes how much damage is this uh six eight next turn plus the hero power and the explosive trap that's 12 so already you he just needs to pick up a or not already you sorry six so needs to pick up a beast or he just needs mm -hmm. to pick up more burn and charge and he basically just no, I, I, his game. I like this a lot uh, it's gonna be hard to play out everything next turn and um, you basically guarantee the double draw with the uh, the quick shot. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's not much you can do here. Yeah. You have to push for damage. You're at nine. <laughs> so. Normally, you know, sometimes you can try to wait on the trap if you can go for the ultimate burst. If you feel like that two health might make a difference, but. Not in this case. You just have to get that damage with the Argent Squire. Yeah. The other thing is, like, um, the draw for this Paladin deck really doesn't work. Um, so even though Art, you, like, you kind of made it work this game so far. Oh. Oh, that's it. That's lethal. That is lethal right there. Yeah, right, aren't so... you not too happy? But yeah, it, it feels like the Paladin is disadvantaged just because of the draw. Like, uh, this, this Paladin deck runs, uh, of course, the Divine Favors that we saw, which again are not going to work against the Hunter. And some of them run Jeeves, but also that doesn't work against the Hunter either, because the Hunter is going to draw damage, and, and his can usually bypass the board if uh, he's losing it. So, um, yeah, the more I think about it, the more... Uh, the more I feel the, the Paladin gets uh, punished in that, uh, and we kind of saw that happen. We kind of saw RDU uh, get a, a pretty damn good start, and it was just punish, 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 no draw, and uh, in the attrition game, uh, obviously the face hunter is going to beat a uh, face Paladin with no cards. Yeah, but more importantly, the face hunter is out of the way, and there, that only leaves room for so many more limited aggression that can come out here. Now that you analyze the decks, it seems like most of them will either be of like a tempo-based nature where they try to be a little bit more aggressive towards the mid-game or, uh, or even late-game possibility. We haven't seen uh, what these Warlock decks are. Maybe they could be li Life Coach bringing Handlock, Firebat bringing Maligos, and those decks often go really far into the game, like turns 10 plus. Yeah. One thing also to keep in mind is uh, even though uh, the score is tied up 2-2, two and two, this is kind of a spot where... Um, if you're RDU, you're feeling you're feeling like the real pressure. I mean, you just cost your team all its losses so far. I mean, it's it's only two losses, but those are both from the Paladin, so uh, it's uh, it's quite unfortunate. And uh, RDU is known to be uh, a pr pretty emotional player, and I think in this in this team format that that really like weighs a bigger weight than normal. So. We might see some uh, some demoralized RDU the next time we see him. 
Well, there's one thing about RDU is that he doesn't lose energy. Um, he is kind of like that, you know, main character in the anime that just like it's really loud and doesn't know when to shut up. Sometimes, like when when RDU, if he wins or loses, ends up talking for like 15 minutes straight and analyzing the game. The kind of player he is. So, if there's anything for sure, I know that he's fired up even more to win and definitely you think looking so? to strike back. Yeah, yeah, I know for think, a fact. You I, don't I've think, seen okay. I've well, seen the opposite well, from him as well. I've kind of seen the, like the defeatist mentality a few times. You think so? Yeah. Uh, I feel like every time I've met RDU, it's like he'll talk to anybody willing to talk or even willing to listen to him talk about Hearthstone, about uh, his games or the strategy or the lineup or the draws or the RNG or the outcome or the plays. Like he, he, there's like so many topics for him to discuss. Um, that's partially why people sometimes enjoy, you know, a lot of his commentary because he's very chatty and talkative about it. Uh, but enough about RDU. We have Life Coach coming up here against Zolay, Warlock versus Druid. And this is uh, the second decks from both these players. We saw Life Coach bring the Warrior, the Patron Warrior. In fact, both these guys put, brought Patron Warrior. But not for right now. Zolay's bringing the Druid here and Life Coach introducing his Warlock, which... It is. N I feel like it's an over ninety-five percent chance of being handlock. Um, I've actually never seen Life Coach play any other type of warlock in a tournament yeah. format. Never. Not even. So once. you're gonna go higher than ninety-five percent. Uh, I'm hoping 100%. it's not. Actually, I'm hope. I I always hope for for the fresh stuff. You know, I hope for something new, something I haven't seen before. Um, but uh, yeah, come on. When you're playing for this much money, when you uh, when you've played few decks. As many times as Life Coach has, you're playing exactly those decks. <laughs> I think so. I think so. I, I'm just surprised that Life Coach just doesn't even consider anything else. Like when you ask him what's his favorite class, he says Handlock. That's not even a class, Life Coach. That's a deck of a class. Um, That's so, a class. Yeah, I, I, it kind of is based off that no one else can really do the things that Handlock does based off its hero power. But specifically, that life coach doesn't even acknowledge that Warlock's his favorite class because he likes playing Handlock. But yeah. that he immediately goes to Handlock's, like not even the fact that he can play Zoo or anything else there. Oh, it's, it's a really good. Uh, it's a really good way to play the game. I mean, you know, you can make it the tournaments when you play ladder, especially in like the new or or mid part of a of a ladder season. You know, everybody is trying to rank up as quickly as they can with the aggressive decks, and Handlock just does. A pretty good job of being consistent against just about anything. I like the way Live Coach said it. He says, if you're better than your opponent, you always should bring decks like Handlock and Control because you have a higher percentage chance to outskill them. Versus if you're better than your opponent and you bring aggressive decks, uh, even if you're better than them, sometimes the draws lean into be a 50-50 coin flip. And so Life Coach likes that edge, extra edge of having that control style, being able to play slower. Um, sometimes yeah. it ends up punishing him, though, because he's a little bit greedy. Like his Paladin decks, like I remember watching a Vi game, and he did end up winning the tournament, but it was like, you know, Kale the Zod and, and like yeah. super late game warning and stuff. And I'm like, I thought we moved past this meta where we can get away playing KT and decks. Uh, it's a cool card to see, though. Yeah, uh, sure. it seems like we're experiencing some problems. Uh, we're actually seeing the rope burn without even seeing cards yet. True life coach fashion, I suppose. It's the ghost of life coach. Yeah, but um, it seems there there are some spectator mode bugs that have occurred since the last few patches in Hearthstone, and uh, uh, we are seeing the consequence of that. All right, now this ancient of war heavily implies that this is more of a taunt druid. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's ramp, though. I mean, you did see the wild growth, and you do see the Ancient of Wars. Uh, and a lot of people might lean towards, you know, oh, awesome, you know, ramp druid. You start playing a lot of late-game threats. You have big taunt minions plus the Ragnaros and Cenarius, etc. But we've also seen some middle-of-the-road druids that play these heavy taunts but still have the Force of Nature Savage War because if you find out that there's no threat of burst and the druid has to win through board pressure alone and you can get away with a lot of greedy plays yeah it's just a bit tough to sometimes fit that in oh for sure because you want to try to get a bunch of um like good curve and you also want to play cards like that really help you continue to ramp um you don't have to worry too much about card draw though because you're often playing only one threat at a time so it's really interesting and dynamic i mean we've seen some ramp druids even go super greedy and play faceless again but I, I don't really think the face manipulator will be making an appearance today. All right. 
Well, it's a life coach turn here. What do we do? Well, you can't tap unless you want to give away the coin. Um, because you'd be at over 10 cards the following turn. The normal yeah. convention logic is to drop the Ancient Watcher since it gets out on the board and you're not going to be using it much anyways. Um, plus it might the threaten Shadow other Ancient Watcher with uh, the uh, Protector next turn. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or maybe just like Protector and, and Tap or something like that. It depends on how things go. Well, you have to draw the other Ancient Watcher, of course. Oh, right, 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 right. Sorry. Okay, some demon flavor. I like Interesting. it. Interesting. Ooh, life coach is not playing mountain giants, or is he? I don't. I don't think so. I think you can play demon headlock and still include um, all the giants. Can you not? Um, it, I mean, you can. It's. I mean, it's not impossible. But it's I do know idea, that void caller. Yeah, it, it doesn't synergize nearly as well because void caller pulls cards out of the hand, and mountain giant yeah. tries to be played on curve and. There's a little bit of awkwardness in that. I remember Strifeco was experimenting a ton with this deck, and he eventually found success that you just had to take out the Mountain Giants, which I thought was really cool, because it's like, well, you know, people thought Mountain Giant was core to Handlock. You tap and you play big minions, but um, Yeah, Drake but just, not. just ends up being a lot better because it's a safer play against BGH and a few other cards. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. So Zelay rightfully, you know, chooses to say, I'm, I don't want to pull out a demon from you. You can keep your demons. I don't want yeah. them. But there are no demons in the hand. No, but it just it just works here. Uh, the thing is, if, if Life Coach doesn't pull a demon, um, Zelay's going to know. <laughs> yeah, it's true, right? There's no demons that you'd want to pull normally in a demon handlock that's bad in this scenario. Um, Doomguard, Dread Infernals, uh, Jaraxxus, like all of them would be okay here, considering that you can pull yeah. them out, taunt them, and then have a really big board. Alright. Well, Sylvanas does some work. It's mostly the um, the Giants that are going to do the work, though. As the Lade doesn't have uh, a good way to remove them, and Druid, if you don't have that BGH, it's just really hard to work around those 8-8 eight, eight taunts. Yeah. For sure. Drawing some cards because he might pick up the Savage Roar and end the game soon. Keep in mind that Handlock's not exactly at the highest life count right now. But how much do you press in here? He also didn't attack with the, the Void Car like you mentioned, Crip. So can he call that bluff an attack? It's going to be a hard read on Zelay's end. It is a pretty hard read, but I think it's one that he's capable of making. I think just more often than not, there is no demon. So... If you feel like you're favored to win, then maybe you won't do that. But if you feel like you're not favored to win... Yep. Ah, Good and stuff. he makes the right call. Very nice. And I mean, it, it's not the most out-of-the-world call, too. I think you broke it down very nicely here. But it's really important that he makes it. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a Shadow Flame play to steal the 1-2 slime, I believe. That comes out of uh, the Belcher... That you, you after you're done so trading in, possible. but I don't really know if I like that play as much as I like searching for other things to do. But the board is also really scary. What if what if you attack uh, Sylvanas into the three five, and then you Hellfire, and then ah. you can tap and play both Molten Giants if you want. So It'll be at ten though. Yeah, you might have to just drop Sun. No, you need the Sun Fury Protector to go into Molten Giants. But I, I, let, me, let me think about that play a little bit more. So you're going to be at two health, right? You only can play one Molten Giant. No, if you tap, you can play both of them. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Because then it reduces to, to ten health. Yeah. Okay. Your opponent's at eight mana, so what's the most damage you can do? Double swipe? <laughs> it's not going to kill you. Okay. Puts up a taunt, 13 HP. It's safe from Innervate combo. Yep. One Innervate is down, and uh, Life Coach doesn't know it, but this is... Um, like, if if Zelly played the Ancient of War, Life Coach may have actually decided to drop a lot lower, thinking maybe he doesn't have to play around it much. Yeah. But we see two Force of Nature's in Zelly's hand, so... This is an interesting deck. Do you want to play the big threat, which might get single removed, or would you play two threats, like the Pilot Shredder and Shade, which are generally a little bit stickier? 
and he did just use a shadow flame. It is susceptible. Right, to right. Fire. So no, with with shadow flame gone, I, like I think the ancient war is is nice here, because with mm. shadow flame gone, and you know it's it's a it's a demon handlock. I mean, I don't even think there's siphon soul in the deck. Like really, the worst thing that's happening is it's getting silenced, and it's not like the worst thing ever because then you wouldn't silence the watcher. Yep. It's also true. Okay, now with with the normal play on Dr. Boom, he does end up dying to a Force Ninja Savage War, but he's actually safe if he plays it because Soleil doesn't have the killing damage, I believe. Mm hmm. And I think the play here is um, the tap Molten Molten Sun Fury play. Yeah, because even if you know your hand, it's still a little bit too risky here. So I, I like that play a lot. So many. And does that use up all seven mana? That uses up six, I believe. No, right? six. So you okay. could get maybe like. Uh... Oh, look at that! Oh, that was play. Whoa! Very nice call. <laughs> oh, that was just. Wait, wait, wait. So we haven't seen a demon yet at all. Um, what demons okay. do you think he has in this deck? I actually think we, we might see the Mountain Giant and the Taunt. It's more mana efficient. Yep. You can keep those uh, Moltens for bigger power plays later too, for sure. Um, what if you just put in like one Void Collar just to troll people? Just, like, just, just to, to well not even troll, but to throw people off? Yeah. That would be really cool and everyone would probably be like, once. oh my god, this is why it life coach is the once, best right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's all it has to do, right? Yeah. It's work once. I wonder. More importantly, if Zelay lost to it, then he has to alert his team, like, oh, hey, by the way, Life Coach plays Void Callers um, in his deck, so just be careful. No, there's no way. He has to at least have one demon in the deck, like yeah, Jarax's. Of, of course. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. A Wrath for one. Okay, so okay. I was anticipating a Wrath for 3 so he can kill the, the giant. No well, this is interesting now. You only have 7 mana, so you can play a 4 to 3. Yep. You just start jumping down those taunts, I believe, and hope to get a nice combo in a turn or two. Yep. Alright, so... Hellfire deals with the board very well, but you go yeah, down to 8 health. It's just pretty devastating. Yeah. But I think you kind of have to do that. So I think it has to be two small creatures into the 5, 6, and you Hellfire. It's unfortunate that um, he's not also able to play the, the Antique Heal bot and Hellfire this turn, because he only has 8 mana. That would yeah. have been... Well, with this play, he'll be able to. And he can okay. Hellfire next turn if he really wants. That's true. Oh, man, a wow. patient assassin. Is that, like, one of the best cards you can get off the Shredder against? I think that's okay, though. Like, with the Sun Fury draw, I think you're okay to Hellfire now. I think you have to Hellfire now. Yeah, Hellfire and then double Molten. Nope, he's just going for the Moltens. Okay, Molten and then anti heal bot. Uh, probably heal. Yeah. That is a mighty fine board. But if he draws Savage Roy, I believe that's game anyways. <laughs> oh <is>. my gosh. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I didn't is count. Is the game five? Um, no, it's not. He's too short. He's too short, right. Okay. Right, the hero power can't get through. Ah, it's really close. Yeah. But he can also, um, like, use Force of Nature number one to help, like, get through these minions a little bit easier and then kill off a Molten and then set up a, um, like, Keeper of the Grove or something like that, too. Although, I think he'd rather... Um, it's, a little, it's a little bit tough to say. Time waits for no one. Yeah, the funny thing is, the patient assassin's really bad. <laughs> well, I mean, it's useful in taking out a giant. 
Yeah, but uh, I think if he got a few other uh, two drops, he could have won. Yeah, he could have won the game, right? If it was three attack or higher. Was uh, it? No, because then it wouldn't fit as nicely. Wait, actually, I don't think it matters, right? Because then he still needs to attack into a taunt either way. Mm. Malganus! All right, so that's the obvious synergy, too, considering that you can pull out Malganus with the Void Caller. Yeah, but is that good enough? I mean, he might not need it. He's got so many ways to be defensive. He can play Sun Fury and Dr. Fury. Boom here. Okay, but like you can't really taunt up much if you do that. Yeah, you can't taunt Dr. Boom and the Molten Giant just because the Boom bots. I feel like you're going to want more cards in this game anyway, so I think you can, uh, you can tap Heal Bot and taunt so up. So many possibilities. The Dr. Boom, though, is a, such a big play onto the board, though. Your opponent hasn't used um, a big game hunter, so maybe he, you're, you're giving him... Like, you basically don't give him much room to breathe by doing this play here. It's a huge amount of damage. In fact, this is threatening lethal next turn already. Mm -hmm. How Puts much are we off? down there. Hmm. Well, yeah, one well, naturalize would have done it. <laughs> one naturalize, you're correct. <laughs> People haven't played that in so long, except natural remedies drew a dick. Mm -hmm. uh, well, even if you had that, actually, you'd still have to take some uh, not that great Boombot RNG against the Force of Nature board. Oh, you're right. Is there an alternative at all to potentially survive here? Yeah. Uh, um, Ancient of War. But then if you have the Iron Beak Owl, then he just gets past it. Hmm. Yeah, but I think you're at that stage where it doesn't matter. Drew the Claw allows him to play uh, Harrison Jones as well. Oh, he's going to go for Keeper of the Grove and try to get past this and hopefully he can combo next turn. It's also appropriate too. If anything sticks, then he can oh, oh sh shot onto the key. Rip on that. Alright, how much damage can Life Coach push for here? Um there's certainly some lethal options with uh Ragnaros. Mm -hmm. Wow. That sucked. Yeah, that was terrible. Oh, God. That was like the worst thing imaginable. I mean, he could always do the 50-50 rag lethal, but there's there's got to be a way to do it even better, right? What if you use Hellfire instead? That no, I don't think there it? is a better one. I think that's I think that's about so as good as it gets. I think the only alternative you have is maybe to just slam down Malganus as well. Yeah, I'd like that a lot too as a guaranteed way to shut it down because if he had Big Game Hunter, um, he still can't afford to combo and kill yeah. you because you had 16. Why did he iterate? Do you have to have Big Game Hunter? Combo no, there's no way. Yeah. yeah. This is very unlikely. I think I'd actually just play it even safer then. I think I'd just kill that. And then, yeah. Exactly. Alright, well, Zelay doesn't really have a way to come back from here. I mean, Druid already has a hard enough time dealing with one big minion. Or taunts. Yeah, not enough mana. This is a cool deck. It's just like all the taunts and double combo, probably. Mm -hmm. They just stall the game until you can play combo. I can see yeah. how that would work against so many decks, but Handlock is not one of them. It's hmm. probably a strong de-emphasis on the five drops that Druid usually has like a lot. Zelay ends up passing, so that's going to end the, the game here. So, uh, really cool stuff from the Druid, like you're mentioning, but ends up being that Life Coach just had too much of a threat. And this is why, traditionally in the past, Druid did struggle against Handlock in the sense that um, I think you, you can't really keep like up with okay against Handlock, isn't it? Like you, well, in you the very beginning, in the very beginning, burst, yeah. before people before people had like the combo threats, right? Because um, yeah. the Handlock just presented two big threats, and Druid couldn't deal with them effectively. And Druid never got in a position where they can really push for the lethal all the time. Um, so it's probably one of the few bad matchups if you think about it, because he's got combo and and like so many taunts, but he still he still has the critical. Uh, druid cards. Mm -hmm. uh, he might be cutting things like Big Game Hunter in that deck, right? 
Uh, it, I I don't know. I, I don't I don't think they'd cut Big Game Hunter. I think he'd cut like Azure Drake's for sure. Probably cut um, some of the the late game options that might people have like Sylvanas or whatnot, and try to go for just heavy taunts because he had Sunwalker in there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's um, a lot. Interesting observation to note too that Life Coach is done, I believe, for the for the day. Right? He doesn't have any other decks yep. to play, so he, he can he can log off and go spend time with the wife. There's one player who's not done at all, and that's RDU. Uh, he's yet to <laughs> yeah. put a win on the board, and he's tried twice now, so uh, he still has a pretty decent climb to go, and uh, he's going to have to get it. It's conquest team battle, uh, one weak point in your team, uh, and you're not winning. Well, he's not alone. Zelay has also tried and failed twice as well. One with the warrior, one with the druid. Oh, that's true. That is true. Yes. Okay. And more importantly, he's also revealed both of his decks and a lot of it too. He lost with the druid, so there's a lot of full information on that druid deck. So yeah, but that's also really like. Already uses deck like his second deck is hunter. He's basically revealed it already. True, true that. But now you know his opponents like ramp druid plus force of nature. So it's like you know mm-hmm. it, it, that's more helpful than knowing like oh well he plays kill command get out you know like you yeah really that for right right. Well, there's gonna be Tice versus Firebat. Um, both these players have won a game. Um, well, it might be the case where at the end it's just uh, someone's gonna have to win out of the people who've tried twice and haven't. Yeah, that's right. By the way, I think it's really it's really funny that the the artist has used both Tice and already used pictures when they have the uh, former team jerseys back when they were on MYM. Really interesting thing there. Uh, Tice he comes in here with winning his Druid deck and Firebat winning his Freeze Mage, but they bring in that Rogue versus Warlock. And I know Firebat really loves being aggressive, so perhaps he will bring the Zoo. Um, that deck performed very well at DreamHack recently and became one of the keys to Tiddler's success, as well as a bunch of other players. And Tice, I haven't seen him play Rogue in a while, but he's also a pretty formidable Rogue player back in the day. Yeah, I think Tice is just uh, generally well-known for his Druid, though, uh, which did pull out a win earlier. I feel like when when I watch Tice, um, he plays plays all the classes pretty well, but it just feels like Druid is... uh, really fantastic to watch just because you can see just how aggressive you can possibly play it and it seems to work out for him so many so many times yeah he pushes the boundaries a lot where sometimes you feel like okay maybe you can pull back a little bit and that might be the case too because rogue functions almost in a similar way if you compare preparation to innervate and you compare like the oil combinations with blade flurry to savage roar and force of nature so this should be a very comfortable deck for tice um in the meantime, Firebat also should be in a pretty good spot too. He's the big challenge with this zoo deck. Oftentimes, is you sometimes just draw really awkwardly because you do scale very well into the late game with Doctor Boom and, and Malgana. So if you draw that early on, you know you're crying. But Firebat seems to at least avoid that pitfall early on. Uh, well, no, he's got Malgana. <laughs> well, I mean, he's got a curve with it though. Like he's not. Yeah, kind active. of. It's not a very high pressure curve. He's going to need a lot of help from his deck still. Do you favor the rogue in this matchup traditionally? Wow, that's really nice. Um, I think the blade flurry is kind of uh, put the rogue ahead of most zoo decks, but this isn't really most zoo decks with with eggs, imp gang bosses, and the Malganus option. Yeah, it's definitely um, a slower approach, the mid range version here. Yeah, I think it's very close. Huh. I think the rogue. The I think egg. Rogue. Yeah, I think the the rogue probably still has the edge though. I mean, you have saps from Alganus. You have the burst. You prevent the warlock from tapping much. Mm-hmm. Um, you just you just kind of have like the rogue. I feel like if you're gonna lose against this, you're just gonna lose against most decks. It's gonna be a case where you just don't really draw any strong cards or combos. Oh my gosh, Firebat has an insane opportunity. Yeah, he does. If you can get Malganus off of this Void Caller. There is Violet Teacher available this turn, and Preparation is an excellent usually to pick up with it. Um, 
Yeah, you I can um, you can vow teacher prep fan and knives after attacking the king boss. Maybe left with a one one on the board, and you'll have two one ones of your own. Mm -hmm. And you draw but a card you'd, you'd, too. Yeah, but you'd waste your weapon with blade flurry in hand, which kind of sucks. Yeah. What about vow teacher and pass? Yeah, looks like he likes that. Mm -hmm. You are a little sad about power overwhelming stuff. Oh, oh my god. god. That's a little bit too hilarious. Then coin out the uh, the void caller. Mm -hmm. This is gonna be a hard game for Firebat to lose. I mean, don't discount the power of Blade Flurry. Um, not to mention that you can deal with Malganus pretty well too uh, if you just draw Sap, and then you can't really play it for a long time. Yeah. But it's pretty bad though, like to to use up a card and mana to deal with a Death Rattle. Feels like that's uh, way too often the case these days. Yeah, you're right. I mean, Tice also could hypothetically put Firebat on a bluff turn too if he wanted to clear it. Like, say, I don't think you have demons, but there's a big chance that he does. Not even necessarily like Malganus, but Doomguard as well is a big problem for Rogue. I think with this play, oh wow, look at that. What well, Goblin out of Barber? I like underrated it. card for sure. Not in arena. That card is kick-ass in arena. Oh yeah, okay. So I'm right. considering it constructed. I was like, okay. Oh, no. no, that's the worst outcome. Oh my god, that drop! Malganus is number two! Can we do it? Oh my god. Trip, I believe... Oh. That, that's like, maybe even worse. This is 36 Zisters of Pain. I, I think a second Malganus would also be pretty bad, considering pretty bad. that now that it's not one, but immediately. two. And they buffed the other Malganus too to yeah. eleven nine. That's so insane. Uh, this is game over just, if you draw the power overwhelming. <laughs> drawn absurdly well. Off the top, remember he uh, he had the Nerubian egg and haunted creeper. That's game. Oh no! Oh no! No! Forgot close. Lothib. <laughs> That's basically game. Like he can't stop you from power overwhelming the turn after. Yeah, 26. Like, come on. How do you lose? Yeah, the only way he can is if uh, there's a Vanish in the deck and he'd survive for one more turn. But Even I don't think there's anything. Sap's a good start, but it doesn't, it doesn't do it. Uh, you have to sap, you have to kill off a creature, and then heal bot. Uh, okay, that does it. <laughs> Yeah, that keeps him alive for another turn, and there is sprint to refill the hand. But now the power overwhelming trades oh my super well. God. Yeah, Doom Guard's really good draw too. Do you want to? Do you want to just go for it, like power overwhelming and Doom Guard, and just push all to Put face? Put him at one. Put him at one. Yeah, perhaps. So many. Possibilities. Does that how does that backfire? If your opponent needs to have like specifically blade flurry number two. Uh I don't think it's necessary. I feel like the juggler is really good here. Mm-hmm. So you get like those extra juggles from the death rattles going off. You just want something to stick onto the board though, because you realize he's so close that Doom Guard should be the finisher. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, well, I guess. Guess sprint. Sprint, or maybe yes. fan, so that you have more mana options. If you fan and you pick up like um, blade flurry, does that allow you to clear the board? I want to say yes. No, you don't have enough to play the um, South Sea. Yeah. So he's going to operate as if he doesn't know his opponent has Doom Guard. He can't afford to, but he's going to try to use Fan Knives here. He's going to leave him the Rubian so he can keep his antique heal bot on the board. Completely reasonable. No matter what, there will be at least a 1 1 surviving onto the board here. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything that can be drawn here. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's gonna be it. 
All right, so now Fireman gets exactly. the second point. Easy game. Tied up. He's three. done for the day. He's done his yep. part. Oh, wow. The BM overkill. Firebat has no manners. Well, I mean, the other players are watching the games, I'm sure. And, um, yeah. And they know that the knife juggler is there. I, I approve of this. I approve of the one extra damage play. Looks good. It was. To me. Maximum overkill is like second Maximum tier. Maximum overkill. BM. The yeah. first, of course, is take as long as you can, time wise. That's, oh, that's, I don't you, know that's, that's that. tier one BM. Well, I mean, you play as many cards as you can. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Time. Really draw out the game as much as possible. That's yeah. that's actually like kind of bad manners. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen yeah. that a few times though. But yeah, yeah. All right. So looking at the bracket, uh, Firebat to his name has two green check marks. RDU and Zelle still looking for their first, while uh, Sixo and Thice uh, are halfway there. Pretty even though, right? This is. A three to three. Um, both of the aces for the team, if you kind of picked one, have also gotten the job done. And so far, it's an evened out with one player struggling a little bit, one player having middling results, and then um, you know another player that's already done here. So very even matchup so far, and pretty fitting for these two teams. Again, uh, we were talking at the very beginning of the day that it feels like it's very appropriate that both of these teams here are matching up in the very beginning, and it's been a very close series so far. Yeah, I mean, we expected both these teams to do very well against each other. Um, it seems like one player on each team is struggling a little bit, but I don't think that's really uh, the fault of the player. It's just kind of how the cards come down sometimes. Um, I am uh, certainly more eager to see how the uh, the more recently developed teams uh, will coordinate their strategy. And uh, it looks like you'll get most of that fun to yourself tomorrow, but uh, we'll see a lot of each of these guys as uh, this is... Uh, this is going to be a very long tournament. All right. Well, I guess we're going to find out to see if RDU or Zelay can start climbing back here. Ultimately, let's take a look at these last three classes here. So we have Hunter, Paladin, Rogue versus Rogue, Druid, and Warrior. Mm -hmm. And now, if can we target a single weak deck that might get exploited here at all? Do you think? I feel like the Paladin uh, might struggle against the Rogue. I feel like the Paladin might struggle against the Warrior. Not necessarily against the Druid, though, right? Because no. outside of Swipe, uh, Paladin's just really good at flooding the board here. Well, maybe, actually, because that, that Druid deck has a crap load of taunts. Actually, that Paladin oh, yeah. sucks against everything. Unless unless it has a quality in the deck somewhere, right? I mean, what yeah, happens but, if yeah. it does? Yeah. Also, that Druid deck sometimes can be a victim of bad draws without wild growth, and then Paladin can just do too much damage. And have a bunch yeah. of like two attack minions on board to get past your Sunwalker. That's true. I feel like actually the the warrior matchup is probably the Paladin's best chance if you just get a really good start and the warrior has to use a couple pieces to stay alive. That often uh, is a pretty effective strategy. Let the hunt begin. All right. Well, Sixo looking to close out his day here with a win on his hunter or on his rogue. Excuse me. Already used the one on hunter. Mm-hmm. All right, well, looks fair. Do damage. Dr. Boom is a fun card. I'm guessing that's the Hunter's hand. Yeah, and th we haven't seen Artie's Hunter yet, so that Dr. Boom already tells us that it's not Face Hunter. It's going to be the mid-range Hunter at the very least, maybe even hybrid, but I'm leaning towards the mid-range. And mid-range has continued to increase its presence on the ladders these days. Um, considering that it's just very robust and flexible, it, it doesn't have the card draw of the mid-range hunter of last year's deck that reigned the terror over the entire meta game. But generally speaking, mid-range hunter is still a very big threat every single game. I feel like right after GBG, like immediately people realized how strong Doctor Room was. They put him in every deck, and that actually included Face Hunter. Yeah, it was like. Top out at Wolf Rider, Arcane Golem, and then Doctor Boom. Doctor Boom, yeah. No, <laughs> that's like the one deck that the guy won in video with, where he had the super aggressive zoo. He had like two powers, two dark bombs, two soul fires, and then he topped out at like, like Wolf Rider, Arcane Golem, and Zoo, and then he had Malganus. <laughs> okay. It was like the weirdest, funny thing. I, maybe oh, he had Void Colors. Yeah, if, if you do that with Void Colors, that seems pretty reasonable. Without that, it seems kind of bad. 
Well, he won the thing, so mm -hmm. not really hard to argue with results. Two well, weapons here. Down. I think sometimes you can argue with the results, actually. Yeah, like, I mean, like yeah. one result, like you can't, you can't argue, like uh, you know, yeah, I think, uh, I think Six was just not a very good player. You just, you can't say that because he's, he's just done well over time. But I think when it comes to like one showing, you, you can actually argue with the results when it comes to Hearthstone. Yeah, you can defy so the odds. Hard games in general. Yeah. So Rogue takes the board, and you don't have a way to kill off the Violet Teacher. That's a really scary point, uh, point to be at, because now. Violet Teacher's 1-1s one -ones are just so good at dealing with Hunter in general because it adds the extra damage, it pops the freezing traps, um, you know, it's really good at taking out some of the damage or adding damage in. Okay, what, what's available here? I, I mean, ideally you want to keep Sap for the high main, but it's also really good here. I am ready to learn. Huh. Okay, goes with the Sap. Let me yeah, see if I can uh, change mics here. This this might be a disaster. Give me a second. All right. Uh, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and hold it. The reason why I said the sap was interesting to keep because he could have dealt with the pilot shredder, also with you know Gelb and Auto Barber and putting other minions onto the board. SI7 agent should be able to kill out, generally speaking, whatever comes out of the, the shredder. But uh, instead, he opts to go for you know a little bit more board levity here. Getting his own Lotheb to counter his opponent's Lotheb, and he's also racing. So as much as his opponent can slam high main down with the knowledge that his opponent doesn't have sap, now this is still a lot of pressure looking at the opposite direction. A right. simple oil play means he dies. How am I doing here? You can hear me all right? Uh, yeah, I can hear you all right, Crip. But I feel a little weird that you're oh, asking me it, how I'm doing. Is it, is it like a like a different like a different Crip now that you're talking to? It is. Okay. It's a little bit more sultry. I like it. More sultry. Okay. Three, four, eight, eleven damage. Six oh two damage off lethal here. Assassin's Blade. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah. I've seen that a little bit. It does. Um, it's more of a traditional like uh, rogue card. It produces some like colossal uh, blade flurries in some cases, and it's it's pretty interesting to see. So I'm kind of glad it's here, but uh, it looks like he's going to win this game, so we're probably not seeing much of it. Yeah, I, I guess it just dies here, um, unless. Whoa! Hello. Wait, unless. No. Uh, not good wait, enough. No, he has. He kills him in the hand, though. There's no way. Yeah, he has to. Um... He has to get a Misha to stay alive. Uh, you're right. Uh, because if, that, it blocks yeah. the dagger damage. Okay. Well, he's going for it. Good stuff. Nope. No? And I don't think How that's good enough. That's 10, 17. <laughs> 17 damage is still pretty crazy. For yeah, it is. Mana. Six mana. Mm-hmm. Well, he's doing his best to stay alive, but it will not be good enough. But more importantly, this is the third loss for RDU? Yeah. He's, uh, he's responsible for all but one of the losses. Oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's definitely tough to swallow here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that as if, if it's his fault. But he well, is I mean, responsible for them. I mean, yeah, he, he it was them. his games ultimately. Yeah, it was his games ultimately. But I think he's he's had good decks. I think he's played quite well. Uh, mm -hmm. No, no complaints. In fact, uh, I think he got a bit unlucky in some of the matchups. And uh, well, my, the real highlight for me was the opening game against Firebat, with the Freeze Mage. Just like such a weird game where uh, like the the Freeze Mage was burning him down. <laughs> Yeah. Like, how often does that happen? It was like being the aggro in the sense of dumping his whole hand and top decking to try to win. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, it is Conquest, and Zele uh, has also failed to produce a win, so we'll have to see. Everyone has to uh, win yeah. on one team for the team to come out victorious. Dog tweets that he's excited to play in a few hours. Him. Kibler and Trump will be up against Cloud9. That's right, Team Value Town is playing later today, guys. And yeah. make sure to hashtag ATLC. Um, 
Uh, he's also pretty accurate that it's probably in a few hours because these best of 11s do take a while. It's almost hour two finished here. But, uh, you know, going ahead and t analyzing what just happened here, I think in the bigger scheme of things, Rogue is the strongest deck comparatively against each other's lineups here. I think um, Tice has a really good shot for this Rogue to also take out whatever comes out. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Tice being sent out here. And then RDU can just kind of focus on turning it around uh, up against Zelay, who might you know, end up not winning a single game, too. I think it'd be really interesting if, like, one player just ends up losing and never having a, a game won. Yeah, um, I feel like, I think I feel it's like though, the, the Rogue won't do particularly well. It's not bad, but it won't do particularly well against what Zele has. You think so? Yeah. I, I, I like Rogue's chances against it, personally. Okay. It's, it's a non-standard Druid, and... The other one's a Grim Patron deck. There's nothing that does that well against Grim Patron. I mean, not really. Especially mm -hmm. not one played by Zele. Um, That's true. I think the the big issue here, because it is Conquest and all these decks have to have to win, I think the, the one deck that's going to really struggle is going to be the Paladin. Mm, let's see. It has, it has to match up against I the Druid. I feel like... Or well, the, that's no, yeah, the, the Grim Patient. The Grim Patient is, is probably the best chance that it has. He I has like the Hunter an excellent might start against the Grim Patient. Yeah, the Hunter's not great, but I feel like Hunter versus uh, Grim Patient Warrior is close to 50 50. Yeah. A lot of people diff actually split their opinions on whether or not Patron's good against mid range. A lot of the top Patron players think it's okay, but some people also think it struggles against mid range. Mm hmm. All right, the battle of... Oh, somebody's going to get their first win here between Zelay and RDU. Yeah, and uh, it is going to be the bench rule if RDU loses here because he is uh, returning to the table after a loss. So if he gets another loss, he will force out Tice to play. And with Tice playing, uh, Zelay will know exactly what deck he's up against. Oh, that's Well, good. actually, no, he'll, he'll be on his last deck if he wins, so it won't matter at all. But no, but you're also in, right, too. In some you situations, it might matter. Yeah, but your statements are all correct. He would know what Tice is playing. It just doesn't yeah, it's have just, an impact. Yeah, it just doesn't <laughs> have an impact. Right. But in, in some cases, it might, I feel. Like, if, if, if you're in this situation in the future in this tournament, it, it's it can be, like, a really big edge to where you have to bench a player who hasn't won into the last remaining deck. And if you have right. more options than just one player, you might be able to switch around and deliberately target that deck. So mm -hmm. the bench rule can actually be quite punishing for the team that benches uh, its player. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen here for Team Nylum, uh, if you're a fan of them. Because RDU is on a losing streak here. And, well, it's uh, he, he's got his hunter deck up against the patron warrior but this patron warrior seems better equipped to deal with decks like hunter because he's got unstable ghouls i wonder if he even runs gromosh because we haven't seen him draw it yet and then yeah. he said he's offered to create more whirlwind effects more board stabilization and less burst from the hand well rd you might be feeling the pressure a little bit his head's looking a bit heavy his head, yeah. He does that a lot when he's stressed. Because he knows also his go-to gamer ranking points are in jeopardy right now. Uh-oh. He's tanking. Alright, well, what do you do here? Um, do you coin out the ghoul? No, you um, don't, I guess. I, I mean, I think the, the coin is really nice valuable. The, yeah, that's true. Because you have 2-3, and then in turn 4, you can coin out the... The... Well, the goal just does nicely against this anyway. Mm. Like, actually, it might kill both of those creatures. As it stands, it will kill both of those creatures. Yeah, unless the knife juggle can hit the... Yeah, there's no unstable. creature to play right now. Yeah, you got quick shot, though, at least. I think that's good enough. You have to, you have to end the turn with something on the board, so it really doesn't give you an option here. You have to quick shot. Yeah, not to mention that you still put the same kind of pressure. Knife Juggler will, is still a threat, and if he has a weapon, he's taking double damage. Okay. 
Um, oh, I guess you enrage and play down what you can. Well, no, actually, you can Warsong Commander, because if the Hunter had a bow, he would have played that over the quick shot. So without a bow, it might it might pull like a kill command or another quick shot. So I think mm -hmm. the not the Arch Warsong Commander, the Warsong Commander, even though it's almost always a terrible card to throw on the board, I think in this specific case it might work out quite well. What does it allow you to do next turn though that you would really benefit off of? There's really nothing that Warsong, I guess, mm -hmm. other than the Grim Patron coming out here, but charging into the the pilot shredder, not really that great. Yeah, that's true, I guess. Wow, well this this is really bad for Zelay, um, in the sense that he can't kill off the shredder guaranteed, and it's a lot of damage. And it's only gonna get worse. Like pilot shredder is just the beginning of the cleanup portion of the of the batting lineup here. We've got, you know, the the low theb into the high main into yeah, if you deal with the high main into really, the hound master. Really nasty. Um, it feels like you might have to draw here. So if you draw, do you armor smith? What do you? What would you want to draw? I guess a weapon, and if it's too uh, an execute or a weapon, yeah. You know. If you drop the armor smith and you don't draw anything, then the armor smith dies for free too. Yeah, that's really bad. So I, it's it's a gamble. You can also just attack the face and try to just hope for the best. Mm -hmm. Thing is, now we're gonna see like an execute top deck after getting low -thibbed. Oh, you're right. You're so right. That's exactly what happens every single time. Every time. All right. Well, Ard, you, uh his head is getting lighter here. He only has to hold it up with. Uh, you know the the mouth hold there. Oh no, it's heavy again. No 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 no, it's it's at the it's at, it's the heaviest at the top too. He oh, always I holds see. the forehead. Mm. Just gotta keep that balance. He does look pretty demoralized, I have to say. But no, um, it's just it's his game face, man. He's in a really comfortable uh, spot. He is actually in this game. He is, but I think. Um, after dropping three games and not getting any points on your board, it's it's pretty uh, pretty nasty. Well, not as nasty as dropping this Lotheb against a deck that benefits so much off of spells. This is and has the coin left in hand. Yeah, this is not good. Well, coin's not really going to do much anyways this turn. I guess unless you want to charge a Frothing Berserker, at least he would have been able to benefit off of things like Battle Rage to draw if he needed to. But now he can't do that either. Would you play a Grim Patron and just attack face so that way you can try to oh draw some God. pressure off it? That is pretty know. nasty. But yeah, I guess... I mean, I don't see any other option here. The Frothing Berserker is really valuable because that might help you keep up into the race later game. Mm -hmm. And you also have a second Patron. And most likely, you're not going to be able to play both of them. Um, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I think it's just going to be such a hard game to play both Patrons. Hmm. Okay, so he wants to go for a Frothing Berserker to challenge the board. Okay. Well, the party is set. I mean, he's got the invites ready, but the the Grim Patron here is going to take Doomsayer. a while for him. Doomsayer? Yeah. Doomsayer? No, no Doomsayer. Sorry. Cool Taskmaster. Using Warrior's cards against himself as well. That's so much pressure. 13 yeah, damage. I, I think I think this is uh, this is almost impossible at this stage. He has a battle rage in hand and a whirlwind, but that doesn't really give him many options. Doesn't he do anything. Draw both executes. What? No. No, he didn't have enough mana to do that. Um. If would you, you... Warsong, Warsong commander into Warsong commander? And kill the two two. Well, I, I, I was thinking uh, Grim Page and Whirlwind here, but I don't know. Well, that's that's not really anything here. The you might even die too on the backswing if he has two kill commands. Pass me that arc light well, how much damage does he have? He's got eleven, thirteen plus six. He's got nineteen. Oh, almost. Kill command is almost lethal. 
Well, or it's um, it's a ten mana lethal. <laughs> yeah, it's a chat legal basically. Well, then it's lethal. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it depends how you look at it. Yeah, for sure. I don't think you would necessarily even mind playing like uh, the abusive sergeant here, but seems good to me. Yeah, you know, I mean, most likely something will stick on board. Whoa, that be BM. The abusive sergeant, the uh, Nobish inventor, and just attack anyways. Okay. Is there any way? I really don't think so. Even if he had execute, he doesn't have enough to drink, bring, uh, bring out the Grim Patron, which would have been great for the with the whirlwind effect. So Zolay ends up tapping out here. We're going to game nine, tied once again. It's always been yeah, it's a one always like one point match. away. Exactly, yeah. a very very slight edge to one team uh, after every round. Um, and yeah, I mean this is kind of what we expected. Uh, at this stage, it's. It's still anyone's game. I mean, uh, either team needs to get two more points on the board. Um, well, the Warrior's still in it, so the Palindex still got a chance, I feel. Yeah, what happened to Grim Patron Warrior? People touted this as the best deck on ladder, and if you're the best deck on ladder, you're one of the best decks in Conquest. I just yet... feel like if, if the Warrior won that one, like, what would the Paladin beat? <laughs> That's true. That's also a good point. Um, the paladin. Well, it has to beat the druid. Yeah, and and, and it, it would need, like, it need to be three to one basically at that stage. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The RD well, needed he, to win that one. Um, there's also no bench rule for Zalay anymore, right? Because you can't yeah. bench him. He's the only player remaining. It's like you you bench him and then Sixo has to come play the deck for you. Mm -hmm. Which at this stage, Sixo might want to. Because uh, it's just kind of frustrating if you're an Archon fan and you're watching Zolay losing his third game in a, um, in a row. Yeah, Is it in a row? I thought I lost one a bit earlier. Well, Z Zolay hasn't won a game. Yeah, it's so 3 yeah, yeah, Zolay right now is uh, the big loser of the, of the tournament so far. Uh, RDU is 1-3. Is Zolay has yet to put a point on the board. But I mean, he's played quite well. He's, uh, I think his Druid deck is really cool. I think it'll work. And uh, Patient Warrior always works, so I'd be surprised if he doesn't at least get one point. I like sending Tice out here right now. I want to give the Paladin as many chances to win as possible. Yeah. Um, and you need to, to get the win out here, too. Um, I guess it doesn't really truly matter, but personally, I would like to see it be mixed up. Uh, also, because I think Rogue's really, I still think Rogue's a pretty decent shot against both these decks here. Mm -hmm. Just want to get the win. All right. Well, they're probably deciding on uh, who to send up first here. You like the Rogue. Yeah. yeah. The reason why I think Rogue is good against Druid is because against Ramp Druid, you if you leverage Sap ever, you just straight up win sometimes, because they can't recover from that t kind of tempo. The only way they can is if you Sap and in, in a position where you don't do anything, like if you have nothing on board, and they just play another big threat. Yeah, the, the Sap the sap sometimes fails, but it's usually in a ladder situation where you like Sap and Druid of the Klon, it just so happens they have an Ancient of War to follow. But in this case, where you know that Ancient of War might already follow, and you save the Sap for it, um, it is a uh, much more potent card. Yeah, absolutely. And I also really like the like the Rose chances for just setting up a big blade flurry because unless the Harrison Jones already has not been played yet, you can always just keep it there. And then Druid struggles from building like a big board because you can just threaten blade flurry. The biggest health minions are Ancient of Wars, but even then, you can it take a while to get out and you can deal with them pretty easily. Yeah. All right, well, Zelle, uh Never Lucky Rubber Ducky versus Tice coming up here. Um, oh, I is feel... that what it is? Probably. Uh, I don't know. That's the only that's... Rubber Ducky I'm familiar with, and I'm quite familiar with that one. <laughs> Please, Crypt. This is not your stream. This is uh, the Archon Team League stream. We can, we can save this all for later. Okay. In the meantime, um, it's like you said, uh, this is like a point where Zelay also has gotten a little bit unlucky. Uh, based off his draws, based off the way some things have sequenced. And Tice can continue that momentum here. But more importantly, Zelay needs to win here. Otherwise, he has a hard time cornering that Paladin deck. Yeah. 
All right, we're, great. Right. we're taking a second here to, to get underway. Rogue also wants to start on the coin, so does the Warrior, because they get more cards to benefit off of it. Usually, sometimes you have an opportunity to go first and pressure before your opponent, but in this case, I think both of them will be searching for the coin pretty aggressively. Mm, yeah, that's true. The coin is such a valuable card in uh, the decks that uh, use multiple card combinations to pull a win. And uh, so not important when you're playing like Zoo, when you just want to go first and slam a one drop. Uh -huh. Well, it's, it's not necessarily even too bad sometimes if you go in the Zoo Mirror. Back in the day when you played Zoo Mirror, it was heavily dependent on drawing Soulfire. So getting the coin gives you another card to draw Soulfire and gain tempo. Yeah. The, the turn one, go first, Flame Imp into second player, Flame Imp, Flame Imp, Soulfire. And, uh, Soulfire. <laughs> yeah. There's no hand. Yep. And then just draw perfectly from that point on. Well, Zella is the recipient of the coin. We can't quite see Tice's hand yet, but... Oh, I here we go. Yeah, and I feel like Rogue is still okay to... Be like, usually it's pretty bad that you don't get the coin, but with the Patron Warrior, you really need to get more cards to draw more cards. At least Rogue still has minions to play as, like, Threats, Violet Teachers, Azure Drakes, SI7. Yeah. So like, Warrior, you just, you just want to hold stuff. Yeah. Like, this will be so much better later. Oh, all these will be so much better later. And then sometimes there is no later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Well, do you cycle this Thanos and just put it out there onto the board? Turn three is an Acolyte turn, but most likely you, your opponent will want to not let Thanos survive because then backstab becomes three damage and a lot of things become threat. Like well, mine. if you keep the Thanos for the Blade Flurry... You'll eventually one shot the um, the armor smith, which isn't too bad. That's true. I mean, just, if you're worried about you don't really do anything kid. until then. That's kind of the issue. You can also just attack the armor smith right now too, if you want to. That seems take reasonable. Yeah. No, no? You want he's to a gentleman. Trap, play it. There's no way to treat a lady. You don't attack her. Acolyte's a very nice draw, but he doesn't have to do that. The uh, the frothing might set up a much bigger threat. I actually kind of like the frothing. Speak to me. The thing about the frothing, though, is that against Rogue, um, a class doesn't generally heal much. Frothing is like a really powerful key to just end the game because you know you can't really rely upon Grim Patrons as much mm -hmm. since Rogue always threatens Blade Flurry. So you're if you can't rely on Grim Patron, your other win condition as the Patron Warrior is Father. So I, I'm okay with him keeping it here. Acolyte Plus draws more cards, and ultimately you need card draw, because you have Emperor Thorsten in hand, and yep. Emperor Thorsten works better with more cards. This this might be shocking yes, to any new Arsenal player, <laughs> but you want to draw as much as you can before you play Emperor Thorsten. Luthor is a nice draw here. Yeah. Um, I feel like you play Luthor. So, weapon up or armor up. Yeah, you know, there, there's a case to be made where you can use weapons to hit the face with Patient Warrior against a lot of decks. Um, Fiery War Axe, though, definitely has more use against Rogue than other classes, though, because there's so many three health minions with the SI7 agents, the Farseers, the Heaglebot. Mm -hmm. Even having Slam, too, is useful with the Fiery War Axe because you can take care of pretty much any minion. So I, I, I wouldn't mind if you just played Loot Hoarder, equipped the Axe, and passed. Uh, that'd yep. also be appropriate. I think I like that. Is there... I mean, he can also just armor up if he wants to play that passive, too. But the thing about armoring up is that you also want to lower your health a little bit for things like Battle Rage. And you don't want to get too high health with armoring up because then you can't... You, you can't, can't draw Battle card. Rage. Yeah. It's, it's tricky. Oh, they can Blade Flurry this, but that seems like a waste. Yeah, Blade Flurry is your key to surviving. Oh, he, he also has the Assassin's Blade, too. Yeah, it seems like it's kind of a running thing. I think he's playing exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'll, I'll admit... Rogue. Yeah, I, I haven't played much Oil Rogue on ladder recently. I've been playing a lot of fun stuff like Echo Giant's Mage and um, other weird stuff. To, to it, was, it was six of those playing Rogue. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was six of the one that also had the assassin's blade, and I'm not sure if it's standard. I believe or not, they also so. had. I believe they both had the uh, 
Goblin out of Arbor now, and which would make sense. Uh, you're, it could be. And that, in fact, if that's the case, then there has there has to be a standardized list that I'm just not aware of at the moment. Mm -hmm. That may be like you know, some really popular rogue players like Super JJ or Dog are playing at the moment. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, oh, well, I think this now. might be okay to develop the Fire War Axe, but also the Frothing Berserker, like you mentioned. Because then he's going to spend his entire turn removing the Frothing Berserker, and then you can play the Emperor Thorson. You also can set up a weapon that would answer whatever he comes out, and then play Emperor Thorson there, too. Well, the weapon's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Um... I feel like Frothing Berserker here is about as good as it was earlier, and he didn't play it earlier. I understand yep. why, but uh, I feel this play is consistent with how he's been playing so far in the match. How do you like setting up Assassin's Blade now? I'm just starting to start whacking. Is that is that too ambitious? Too slow? Seems fine to me. I mean, your other alternatives are kind of bad. Because the weapon answers everything, unfortunately, with the Loot Hoarder. I mean, what other play do you have? Like, prep SI7 or something? I don't know. God. Or just weapon you can use SI the prep seven. on. Hmm. Not take two damage. Yeah, I suppose so. Sap's not, not even that great against this deck, other than dealing with, like, something that's really awkward. Like, uh, if you don't want to give your opponent cards on an Acolyte or you don't want them to gain armor. Mm -hmm. But Sap's not really that great against Patron. All right, so I guess you just play the Emperor Thoris in here. These, this card quality Seems to reduce the cost is great. Yep. Um, you don't quite have seven because the coin doesn't really count, but six cards is pretty good. But the coin will only cost four when you drop Lothab. So yeah. Whoa. <laughs> just the next uh, turn you five can more coin... turns and it's actually useful. Next turn you can coin out a Grim Patron. Mm-hmm. Uh, he picks up an oil, so that's major damage with the blade flurry. Um, well, how much can you play here? I feel like you if you if you play the oil, you want to play a creature, but the cheapest creature is three, so you have to do the prep oil is four mana. I wonder. So yeah, you could do it. You could do prep si face. Uh, play the oil, go face, and blade flurry. This guy's toast. Oh, this is cute too, like forcing him to attack into the SI with a lot of damage. I like that. It pushes for one extra weapon hit, and it's mm -hmm. pretty good when it's six damage. Yeah, that's excellent. In fact, that's 18 damage just in this uh, Assassin's Blade alone, and he's threatening 12 next turn. In fact, if he takes the damage here, oh, that's nice to execute. But if he took that damage, that would have been lethal. So this is a really cool move from Tice. And because Emperor Thorson is slow in the sense that um, it, it costs six out of seven mana, you're not too worried about him playing it too, because most likely you just end up passing. In this yeah. scenario, though, Zalei can play Emperor Thorson and clear. He also has. He has some kind like of charge combo of potential, doesn't he? Huh? He has some charge combo potential. Yeah, let's go ahead and count that too. The Warsong plus the two Frothings and Whirlwind is uh, four, seven plus uh, the four minions on board times two. So that's eight. That's 15 damage. Yeah. yeah. But he gets the execute. That's the nice thing too. Yep. So, Blade Flurry almost certainly will come out here, and Zalei will really put his down, 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 down to 8, right? Uh, no. It's a 6 damage weapon, so it'd be 10, wouldn't it? Oh no, I was saying uh, he puts Zalei down, to, or he puts Tice down. Oh down. yeah. Sorry, I, I misspoke, I misspoke. I was confused. Oh no, it is 8, look at that. You're right. <laughs> that's right. What I say must come true. Thank you, Blizzard. No, no that's going to be the Lothab. It makes the most sense given that uh, the Lothab was shut down spells and his opponent yeah. did play Thorson earlier. 
Yeah, you want to shut down spells and then heal. It's stronger than healing, than taking a lot of damage, than playing a Lothab on nothing. Plus the added board development. Very nice. Yes, sir. I think I like the the ghoul Grim Patron Acolyte here. Yeah, that utilizes 8 of your mana, and Emperor Thorson doesn't really do much power here, other than the fact that it's a 5-5 five, five body, and your opponent just used a Blade Flurry, and he also used his weapon buff, so it's not like he has a lot of options to deal with Grim Patron. He would have to have mm. a second sap, followed by Which a Viscerate for you to die. Mm. What's scary is that he, if he does end up doing this play, the Grim Patron plus the Acolyte hidden behind the Unstable Ghoul, Tice only needs two more points of damage for it to be lethal. Yeah, Zelly, Zelly won't have lethal here, but uh, he can draw to a lot of options. Yes. Not to mention he might kill his opponent too, if he can't deal with it. Like, Despite might just be it. Oh, he ends up just holding back, so that way he can stay alive. And that's the right call, right? Because yeah. that... It, I don't know, he's, I think he's still dead. No, I think he's still dead. Ah, uh, okay, well... Six dagger... Yes, that is exactly lethal with exact mana. Well, that's it then, and Tice is out of this, uh... This round, because he's ends up winning with both of his decks, and that means the lay will have to take out this Paladin deck. And Nylon's up 5-4. Um, I believe uh, Tice can st stick around, right? He's just lost the one. He, uh, they have the choice of whether they want the the rogue or the paladin in the matchup against the true. Look, the, the rogue. rogue won though, so the rogue's eliminated here, which means that only paladin remains for Nylum. And Zelay. Oh, right, right, right. Zelay, Sorry. Zelay has Sorry. still yet to win his first game. He's zero. And I'm four. sleepy today. Sorry. No worries, um, man. Yeah, slow day. That's okay. what I'm here for. <laughs> Crip's having a lot of fun, guys, casting this match. <laughs> it's it's really close, though. This is, like, really insanely yeah. close, and it's actually it starting to get a little close. bit, like, beyond the joke that Zelay hasn't won. It's like, this is actually really scary for Archon fans, because um, yeah. now you get two chances for this Paladin, which, if it draws, like, super well and perfectly, um, it's, it's an aggro deck. It has a 50-50 chance of winning, just straight up based off the way things sequence. Yeah, the I, feel, I feel the chances are probably a bit better against the Warrior. I feel they're not great in either case, but still close to the 50. It's just, uh, I think you're a little bit unfavored in both of these. I think generally against Druid, you're supposed to do extremely well, but it's got so many taunts, and I feel that kind of matters. I think so too, but I mean it is scary because at the same time, um, RDU, we still don't know what his deck contains in terms of all of its tech cards versus Zelay. I feel like we've seen almost everything we've needed to see. There's nothing else that would really surprise us mm -hmm. outside of like a Death Wing in the Druid or something like that. Yeah, I mean, no, no one would do something like that. That's no chance. No, nobody will do that anymore. Okay. Well, Rubber Ducky. One more time sent up here. Archon on the verge of losing their first game in the yeah. Archon Team League Championship. So Nihilum is on match point on the back of yeah. this Paladin deck. You this think he's going to take this right one? Here right now? Like right now? It's Paladin versus Warrior. Yeah, I actually think so. I think this is... I think Agro Paladin is, is pretty good against He's uh, the better Warrior. of the two matchups, at mm. least. Like, if you look at matchups that are good against Patron, there's not many that are, like, favorable in a considerable margin. Um, but if you look at decks that are, like, pretty okay against it, this deck puts just enough pressure in the same way that um, any other deck that puts pressure on combo decks makes him crumble. And he's curved out well. He's got the coin, which is also pretty good, too, considering that he can put double one drops. Uh, maybe feel, not necessarily Abuse of Sergeant, though. I feel the coin is mostly good just because you deny the warrior from having the coin. Yeah, that's also an important factor, too. I think in general, it's better just go first when you have a lot of one-drops. Okay. Well, double one-drop here is pretty awesome. Well, we've seen the YOLO knife juggler, and hope you don't get Fiery War Axe play a few times now. So we might just see that again. <clears throat> That's true. If you if he doesn't get answered, it's a lot more damage that way. You get 
you get four more damage, I think, because you're able to get the plus attack from the night mm -hmm. juggle plus the juggles itself. But and um, the thing though is that it does get answered by unstable ghoul. Both these things actually get answered by unstable ghoul. No, I think um, like you already saw the, the warrior's deck. You know he has armor smith and unstable ghoul. So I think if you play the knife juggler, the knife juggler only gets countered like directly by the axe, while the other two get countered by armor smith and the ghoul. So I think I like the knife juggler a little better. All right. Well, this is still a pretty good anti aggro start for Zelay. He's got lots of ways to pick off small health minions. Okay. So now he feels comfortable at least dropping Knife Juggler here. Yep. Unfortunately for RDU, the coin wasn't converted into any damage really, but uh, at least one Unstable Ghoul is out of the way, and now he really hopes that he can't deal with Knife Juggler, which he can't. Uh, it's not the worst thing ever. Drop the armor smith, gain some armor. I think with the, this type of paladin deck, you just play on curve and hope for the best. So, I think the only decision here is whether you want to attack on the armor smith or not. And I think you do. And I think you do attack first before you muster to get the full juggle effects. Yeah, the, the worst case scenario is like if you juggle twice into it and you wasted damage. Plot so you'd want to attack first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I'm saying you attack you first, then the yeah. Yeah. Because if it hit once, you're okay. It's okay. If it hits three times, you're okay, but twice is like the yeah. really mm. bad point. Three times would be amazing. Ha! <laughs> That'd be so sick. I mean, at the same time, your opponent, you're just hoping that he doesn't have Whirlwind, but you still get three damage here, too. Uh, to the face guaranteed, because if it kills Armorsmith, you still have the weapon hit, too. Yeah. Alright, okay, well, Zelay needs to get more than just his inner rage, because there's still a lot of 1-1s pecking away. Well, I think that's all he's going to get. He has the option to battle rage for one card, but... I mean, this is kind of like what we were talking about, like where the draw doesn't start, and the deck just kind of crumbles, or you have to use cards to stay in the game. Mm -hmm. that you'd otherwise really want to save. Yeah, I think the slam is really valuable because Divine Shield is pretty important to RDU's deck in terms of making sure to maximize damage and board presence. Mm -hmm. So I think keeping on to that is really good. And like you said, putting out the net, that loot hoarder is important for the draw. Well, there we go. Like you said, curving out well and being able to use out all your mana utilization is really huge here. But the important thing is that there's still no Whirlwind effect. RDU knows that would have been the turn for Whirlwind. He doesn't have it, so not that it would yeah. change the outcome of his plays, but he has a pretty good tell on what Zelay has and doesn't have here. Well, has okay. Look at that. <laughs> not bad. I think you'd even clear out the Anoyatron because that just kind of sucks. Uh, yeah. But this would definitely be pretty crushing. Um, well, I guess you could play the 2 4. No much of challenges the board very well. Mm -hmm. Not bad either. The Acolyte's just okay to draw, especially with you have the, the Warsong Commander next turn. Mm -hmm. for duty. At this point, RDU is just left to try and hope that he draws either really big damage or he gets. Divine Favor, and his opponent managed to draw a lot more cards than he has. More Song Commander again. This is like okay stuff. Yeah, like, unfortunately. With two, with two War Songs, you can burn the Acolyte, which I think is fine. I think that's pretty decent, actually. What mm -hmm. The other play is to slam down the Juggler and uh, Battle Rage. That might be okay. Battle Rage it gives you two chances to pick up Fiery War Axe and help clean up this board a little bit. Acolyte's more of a guarantee, though, and it gives you board presence. Especially since there's two minions. Yeah. Monster, monster number two. This doesn't help much. 
I guess he's got to Consecrate. And then you're pushing for damage with 1-1s one and giving him cards. You can't feel good about that, but Zale is still not in the best spot. He's still behind on the board, and he still doesn't have an answer right now. But Zale's hand's a little awkward, too. It's, it's got... Oh, man. It's got Another. more ways to draw and, and the war song commander. Reporting for duty. So now it really is divine favor of bust for RDU, I think. Yeah. Hmm, cool. Not bad. Yeah, Unstable Cool can... Do you think he can legitimately hide it behind something? What if he draws the Iron Beak Owl? If you hide, like, Acolyte behind it. I don't think it's necessarily mm. bad to even play one Warsong Commander and charge an Acolyte here. Because... Um, yeah. The thing is, more you have draw. a second Warsong Commander, and you get more draw and yeah. board presence. And uh, really, if if your opponent had Defined Favor, he would have played it last turn. Okay. Unstable Ghoul sets up a better battle rage. Okay. Okay. Well, that Grim Patron comes into hand. He's going to have eight mana next turn. And that 7 mana ends up working out okay, although he does lose the 1-1s one on the muster for battle if he chooses to do that. Yeah, ah. that's a bit of a tough one. Well, he kind of has to it's... do that to kill the War Song, though. Yeah, and more importantly, I think on turn 8, there is the Grim Patron combination as well, even if you deal with this War Song. So, stuff to keep in mind as this turns ends up developing. There's a couple ways to do it. So do you want to give up your one ones and do and kill off the war song, or do you want to just play the the muster for battle and hope that one of them sticks? It's, it's very optimistic to do that, though. I like the king's play to clear the board. Nope. All right, so he lets the war song live. But we know, Crypt, that this is not going to end very well. No, it's not. It's everyone to get in here time. This Grim Patron is going to absolutely destroy everything. And if he picks up another way to synergize off of it, like if he had the opportunity to get uh, Frothing Berserker, I think it would have just been lights out. But from here, it's already looking like Zelay has turned the game around because this is what every... Um, Patron Warrior fears, or sorry, Paladin fears against Patron Warriors. The fact that their hero power naturally lends itself to a weakness against Grim Patron. Yeah, but I feel if you're in this spot and you don't have any cards, you haven't done too much, you're pretty much losing anyway. Uh, this deck is so reliant on getting one of its draw mechanisms out. <laughs> okay. I guess that's something. Yeah, that is something. It doesn't clear the board exactly, though. Yeah, the so attack you... first is better because it stops from spawning the other one, so we have a one health Grim Patron left. Mm -hmm. This is actually a very important technical play that I think most players will miss. So if you Consecrate first, he gets a, a full health one, but if you do this play, he gets to keep only a 3-1. Because the extra one will not spawn. They all die mm -hmm. at the same time. Yep, that's right. And the Grim Patron with one health is... Not really that useful. It's just basically a Scarlet Crusader with that. It's, uh, uh, but look at that! We have another Warsong Commander with another Grim Patron. Yeah. More importantly, uh, we have a, a lot of ways to stabilize here from this point on. He's got the Armor Smith, so that way um, he can crash into stuff and even gain life. And I would say that... It's probably better. It's probably even okay just to not do the Grim Patron. One. Well, if you, if you don't play the Grim Patron, you can do like Armor Smith and Acolyte. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, I think both routes aren't bad. I think it's the same exact concept, though. It's like, he can't kill me, so I'm just going to be aggressive. And I yeah. want to race him as opposed to give him time. True Silver Champion comes to the hand. That's 8 damage over 2 turns, but his opponent will be at 17. And that's just way too far out of reach. More importantly, yeah. he's, he's dead next turn because of Warsong staying alive. No, he has to kill Warsong and stay alive. Oh, he doesn't. Oh. Okay. Well, that okay, is it then. Well, 
Way too much damage. Falling Berserker comes into hand too, so we have an even series going to game number eleven. That's right, best going to game of the game best eleven. Best of eleven when he's going to game eleven. Wow. I, I mean, I kind them. of expected this to happen, but again, I'm surprised that it happened. I, I don't know. It's kind of a weird feeling. I, that's probably a pretty dumb thing to say, but but still, I really feel that. It's like, you know, you feel these guys are really evened up. But still, like in a best of eleven, to actually make it to the eleventh game is pretty stunning. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so overall, I, I think this has been pretty close and tightly contested. Uh, but we're about to have one player ultimately be the weak link today. One player will go one and four, one and five potentially. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Because already he's lost four. Or Zolay's lost four. And yeah, this both these players have really struggled, really but um, really the biggest struggle has been the Paladin deck because I think out of those four losses, the Paladin is responsible for three of them. Has it? I think yeah, so. Yeah, his other one has been Hunter. I think he lost once with Hunter, and then it won. <sighs> That's not good at all. But at the but same he time, uh, Zalei... It hasn't really had much chances with the Druid yet either, so we don't know how much... Um, we don't know how, yeah, how well this deck stacks. The Druid is 0-1, right? Yeah. Because most of his losses have been with inconsistencies from the Grim Patron Warrior. Alright, well here we go again. RDU versus Zele in the uh, the final match for Nylum versus Archon. Here we go. Wild Growth to start things off for Zalay. A great That's start. That's really good from the Druid. It's pretty good from the Paladin too, but I feel like it's it's a match where the Paladin is just going to draw well almost every time, and the Druid not so all the time. Yep. So if the Druid draws well, I think he's going to be ahead, generally. That's right. Firebat was telling me about how aggro decks, the sweet spot for him, for, for those aggro decks for his opinion, is that six is a really good number because if you have six one drops, then you have a 70 plus percent chance to draw it in the opening hands. And it even gets better if you have the coin. So he feels like, yo, it's, that's a really good number. Now, the Paladin deck has eight, generally speaking. You have two Busa Sergeants, two Leper Gnomes, two Argent Squires, and also the Pirates, the South Sea Deckhands that also appear in. Mm -hmm. And if you have that many one drops, you're absolutely right, Crib. There's a, such a high percentage chance that you curve out well, especially on turn one. And Druid, even though you do have the opportunity to play things like Wild Growth, you get the luxury of being able to play Wild Growth and surviving if your opponent does too much damage to you. But thankfully, Zalei has the best hand I think you can ask for. Because Swipe will deal with whatever small minions come out, especially from the muster for battle. And yep. you're able to successfully take out things and pick them apart with things like Wrath and Keeper of the Grove. What do you think about this coin? Rather than just um, getting a Greed Swipe after a Wild Growth. Hmm, well, it does open up a possibility of drawing to a turn three play, but I think he's just going to open up anyways to a hero power. It is very interesting because then it's, he's floating one mana either now or next turn. And in this case, it's now. Yeah. Yeah, it works Eight. out fine. He likes the wrath option, I guess. Oh, he just wants to minimize damage. I guess he doesn't want to swipe next turn. He's probably going to have to, though, with that. Uh, well, he's got Keeper of the Grove as an option as well, so if his opponent plays Knife Juggler, he can just dunk it. But there's so many Divine Shields! Can you imagine Blood Knight off the top here, just magically? If he decided to just call 12, it? 12 <laughs> Oh my gosh. That is the worst swipe ever. Against an aggressive Paladin. No, you can just Keeper, I guess. Keeper's fine against that. Your opponent would have to have Kings or True Silver. I guess if you keep her and if he has kings, you're going to lose and be really sad. That's a good point, too. Blessing of kings is a legitimate threat here. I mean, this is, this is like typical arena, by the way. You're in this position. It's like, I win unless he has the cards that they always have because they're ridiculously powerful. They're picked every time. Yeah, he's playing around Blessing of Kings so much that he's willing to cash in a swipe just to remove Divine Shields. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, let, let's be real, that was kind of like the same effect as Mass Dispel, but you got to hit damage before this phase. It just, it, now all these minions are still attacking you, yeah, and you're still taking damage. Well, Mass Dispel, not really the best card. I think I like the Belcher over the other swipe here. Uh, Belcher does complicate damage a little bit, where he has to trade more into it, rather than easy uh, clear. Wow, that card's awesome. Yeah, Divine's favor against a heavy deck is so good because Druid plays one threat at a time. It's just well, so good if you um, if you get like an abusive surgeon or something here. Right. Four cards for three mana. Pretty good. Move aside Dragon Vigil or whatever it's called. Solemn Vigil. Yeah, it's Solemn Vigil. Much better. Uh, generally, yeah. Oh, he actually loses charge on the, the South Sea if he uh, attacked the weapon here. That's kind of funny. Yeah, but I think that's still a play to make. Because <laughs> now you just use 2-1, or 2-2 two, two to become 2-1, and then uh, you push for one little damage. And it's like we said, even though this Druid deck can usually handle aggro, unless you deal with all the small minions before you play the threat, then they just pick apart the... The big taunter. Yeah. Well, you can clear with Force of Nature here, which is a card that's a lot harder to use later on. So you might actually choose to do that over the swipe, because if you swipe, you still can't play anything. Just go Yeah, with right. Exactly. Um, the Force of Nature gets really clunky. It's just so hard to play. Like, you're on, like, turn 8, and you have basically the same problem as you did with swipe, where you just turn 8, just one Force of Nature, hero power. And uh, playing the swipe there, more uh, divine shield. Even though it has the same effect on like turn eight, you might be able to swipe and keeper, for instance. Them it's a nice play shields. around betrayal as well. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter, but okay. Well, does Ancient of War stop this madness? No, because he has the true silver and well, divine means, favor. Wait. Oh my god. Yeah, he's got... Yeah, this is second very, game. very hard for Zele to win. So then, what's the right play if he knew RDU's hand? Is it still the Ancient of War? Yep. Because it's just on curve, that's the best option to go about it. I mean, I don't know if he necessarily needs to... Divine Favor for three. Div yeah, Divine Favor right now. He can play Mustard for Battle, get some juggles, and then use Divine Shields because he's still a little I bit short think. of clearing it cleanly, and he wants to get the damage in. So if he plays Mustard for Battle first, gets the juggle in, and then play the Choose Over Champion, he most likely should be able to push through whatever comes out. Mm -hmm. I was looking at Divine Favor. Reporting for Ooh, okay. I think with Amen. those juggles. Oh, that, that was perfect. Wow. That's there we go. Unbelievable. Uh, I guess you just put it onto your mini bot, right? Yeah, I put it on the juggler. It makes it a bigger silence target, but if he has silence, it's dead anyway. I kind of like it on the mini bot better, though. It makes it yeah, so you because... have two high priority targets rather than yeah. one. Yeah. Now there's like two targets you would want to kill versus putting on knife juggler is like the ultimate target. Now I think this is a spot where you choose to play a Shredder over Hero Power and Gallop 2-1. Yeah, maybe even consider a Keeper if you want to take two less damage. The Shredder versus the Keeper is the same thing. Both minions will be cleaning up a lot of the small minions. And the Keeper gives you immediate return now. He already used the buff anyways. And if he... Um, if he ends up using Blasting of Kings, you can use... Hey, you're just screwed either way, so... <laughs> I must safeguard the land. <laughs> there's three, seven, That's nine lethal. damage. Oh, there's ten. There's ten. Okay. Yeah. So, that does it, and looks like RDU is going to take the win for Nylum. He struggled well, a little bit in damage. the beginning, well but Zelay ends up going one and five. Oh, uh, RDU! So, yep. That hype. And Zelay. That depression. Basically, just flip that screen upside down and have uh, the same emotion. 
I suppose. Congratulations to Nylum. They take home the inaugural victory here for the Team League Championships. Yeah. Uh, looks like uh, Nylum definitely had a little bit of things to be worried about with that Paladin deck, but overall, a job well done. And after 11 games, Crip, two and a half hours straight, we finally have our first victory for this Team League. And it is Nylum. Great job from them. Um, but yeah, the, what I thought would be like the funnest deck of this lineup, the Paladin, did seem to uh, be the least consistent, uh, the least uh, winning deck. But uh, in the end, it pulls out a win. And um, yeah, Zelay uh, doesn't make it happen for Archon. But again, it's, uh, it's really not fair to pin it on him in the end. It's not really his fault that it ended up this way. It just, well, it just ended up this way. Yeah, I think so. And I feel like Zelay played pretty well. He definitely wasn't the worst play player today um, in terms of... I think of everyone how played he, very solid, actually. Yeah. He wasn't the worst player in terms of how he navigated his decks, but in terms of how the outcome is, it's unfortunate that his uh, results don't match up with how he actually set up and prepared for this yeah. match. So that is our halfway point, everybody. We have one series done between Nylum and Archon, but we have one more to go, one more best of 11 yeah. between Cloud9, featuring some of your favorite players like Clanton, Strife Crow, and uh, Ika, and Team Value Town with Trump, Dog, and Mr. Brian, Brian Kibler, Kibler himself. Mm -hmm. That should be interesting. Um, I'm pretty curious to see what, uh, what decks these, uh, these players have brought. Uh, yeah. I am hoping for more adventurous stuff. Um, even though uh, the Paladin didn't quite make it uh, mm -hmm. you know, too pleasant for RDU, uh, I thought it was pretty cool, and I'm hoping we see some of the cool stuff still. Uh, yeah. I know Kibler is a player that always plays outside the norm uh, when he ladders, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know if he's willing to bring that game to this tournament. See, in, in the team format, you, you generally try to be pretty conservative, especially if you're playing with players who you haven't before. That's uh, another thing to really keep in mind where, um, you know, if if players have played together and it's like, you know, trust me, I got this one with this deck, but and they've played together, they're like, maybe go with that. But if Kibler's like, nah, guys, I got this, Dragon Paladin all the way, um, I don't think he's going to feel good about that. I don't think his team is going to feel good about that. So it'll probably be more standard stuff from Value Town and uh, maybe some interesting stuff from Cloud9. All right, cool. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a few minutes, guys, and uh, get ready for our next series. Again, it should be a really fun time. Uh, we're going to stick around, too. So when we come back, we're going to have our second series of the day, which is Team Value Town featuring Trump, Don, Killer up against Cloud9. Stay tuned.